Okay, Mayor, we are now live. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I would like to call the June 23rd, 2020 meeting of the East Lansing City Council to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Babcock. Present. Councilmember Gregg. Here. Councilmember Meadows. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Stevens. Here. Mayor Byer. Here. Uh, the first item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Um, I move approval of this agenda. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilmember Babcock. Seconded by Councilmember Babcock. Thank you. Um, any questions or changes to the agenda? All right. All those in favor of approve. All those in favor of approving the agenda, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? The agenda has been approved. The next item is approval of the minutes from June sixteenth, twenty twenty. I move approval of these minutes. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by the Mayor Pro Tem. Any questions, changes to the minutes? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes have been approved. The next item is item 2.1, communications. Uh, communications that has have re been received by council are posted on the website and um, all, all the written communications. We recently discovered that um, quite a few communications that have been sent to council, everyone on council, were not also sent to the council account. So they were not automatically um, uploaded. So I took care of that today and um, I'm not sure if they're on tonight, but if they're not, they will be on the next um, meetings. So if anybody else has a written communication that they don't see that's been posted, please let me know and I will again, make sure that that uh, gets posted. The next item is communications from the audience. The way we will do this is the way we have been doing it. Um, Ms. Bartell will call every phone number in the audience. If she calls your number, and she'll, I think she's using the last three digits or four digits, the last number of digits. If she calls your number um, and you wish to speak, you may. If you don't wish to speak, you can just say pass. We are asking um, you to limit your comments to five minutes and there will be a clock to help you out with that. Um, I think that's everything. Ms. Bartell. Thank you, Mayor. The first call this evening is a phone number ending in 119. You may now address council. Yes, hello, good evening. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Thanks. Yes. My name is Diane Cardenas Johnson, and I'm a resident of East Lansing of four years. And prior to that, I was a resident in Chicago, Illinois. Within these four years, I participated in the East Lansing Emerging Leadership Program of 2019 and have submitted the application to be a part of the study committee on the Independent Police Oversight Commission for East Lansing. I currently have a master's degree in special education, bachelor's degree in political science and my administration certification. As a special education teacher and a minority, thus being a woman and Mexican American, I believe it is important to be part of the solution and not the problem, as well as standing up for what is right. And in this case, I'm speaking on behalf of Officer Andrew Stevenson. On September 26th of 2019, I almost lost my husband to a cardiac arrest. If it was not for Officer Andrew Stevenson, Officer Matt Heffelfinger, and Sergeant Eric Vetter, my husband would not be alive today. I have read the Lansing Journal and posts that have been made about Officer Andrew Stevenson on social media, and I do not believe those incidents were based on race. I am Mexican-American, and my husband is a black man. If Officer Andrew Stevenson is a so-called racist, he would not have visited my husband and I for a follow-up at the hospital the day of the incident. My husband was fighting for his life in an induced coma, and, Andrew, and Officer Andrew Stevenson came to the hospital to check up on him and even prayed with me. He also gave me his card and asked me to give him updates on Kobe, which I did later after Kobe was released from the hospital. Later did I know that he would continue to stop by our house to check in on both of us. 
This speaks volume on his character and goes above and beyond the call of duty. A few days later, after my husband was released from the hospital, we went to go visit Officer Stevenson and give him a gratitude of appreciation. He knew that we were giving him a gift, and before we got there, he made sure to mention the other officers that were also involved in saving my hus- husband's life. And that just, just shows his character, that it's not just him getting, you know, all the, the attention. He wanted to make sure that his other fellow police officers were also acknowledged. We dropped off gift cards for them. Little did we know that later on, Officer Stevenson would show up at our house again just to let us know that they were not allowed to receive monetary gift cards, in which they ended up using to buy presents uh, for Christmas that they would donate to other uh, charities. I believe that Officer Andrew Stevenson is being used as a scapegoat based on recent national events. As a community member, it is important that we all work together if we want to make progress going forward. We all need to do better for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bartell? Thank you, Mayor. The next caller on the list is phone number ending in 131. You may now address council. Again, this is phone number ending in 131. If you would like to address council, you may do so now. And one final time, this is 131. You may also need to try unmuting your phone if it's muted um, or dialing star six. Okay, hearing none, I will move on to the next caller. The next caller on the list is phone number ending in 194. One nine four, you may now address council if you would like. And one nine four, it looks like you have just muted yourself. You may want to try speaking again now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have some questions that I would like to direct to the mayor. Um, I'm wondering as a web, as a resident of East Lansing. What concerns should individual have with your city council acting as prosecutor, judge, and jury in deciding what and how criminal cases are handled? If you would, wouldn't mind just to make sure you get, can you stop the clock for a second, please, Nicole? Thank you. If you wouldn't mind asking all of your questions at one time so you make sure you get your full five minutes, that would be great. So I'm gonna write that one down. And if you have, do you have any further questions or is that the only one? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Yep. Um, additional questions are, what do you anticipate the ramifications of legalizing and publicly condoning assaulting a police officer in order to a- evade arrest will be? What okay. caliber individuals do you expect will come to serve and protect citizens at East Lansing Police Department when you publicly doubt the credibility of public uh, of the current officers. I would like to know if members of city council are asked to go on ride-alongs or if they have been on ride-alongs with East Lansing police officers or if they have been a member of the Citizens Police Academy. I'm not sure if any members of citizen uh, of City Council have ever been a victim of a violent crime or ever utilized 911 services in East Lansing. Um, but I cannot speak more highly of the officers and the caliber of the men and women who serve every day and sacrifice their family lives and put their lives on the line to defend the welfare of these people who live here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, So I will answer your questions and then I will let other council people answer uh, the questions that were 
directed to all of us. So I have not been a victim of a violent crime in East Lansing. Um, I have been on a ride along with the police in my first year on council. Um, as for being a judge and jury and prosecutor of, of the police, I assume you were talking about my comments about the um, logins uh, arrest and um, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the prosecutor, the, the judge or the jury. <clears throat> I'm just, I was just speaking of what I saw in the video uh, when I was talking about that. I'm not sure if you've watched it yet or not. Uh, in terms of recruits, yeah, this is, this is going to be an issue. Um, being a police officer now is very hard. Being a police officer who has already worked on their implicit bias or their explicit bias and is doing their best and is growing and can recognize when their bias is making them react, that police officer is doing everything they can and is still being painted with the same brush. And I agree with you on that. I don't know how to, I don't know how to be more nuanced so that I can say for all of you police officers who are already working on your bias, then keep working and I'm very grateful for that. For those who are still in denial or think that the way that they are acting is okay, even though African Americans are pulled over more often or injured more often than white Americans, then they still have work to do. But I agree, it will be harder to recruit police officers of any caliber. And we will be looking, I'm thinking we will have slightly fewer actual police officers and we will be looking for for the highest quality officers even even well, i'm not that's i'm just gonna leave that up there uh, and th i think that answers your caliber question as well um would anybody like to answer the questions about being a victim of a violent crime or being on a ride along um council member greg council member meadows and then mayor pro tem um i have not been a victim of a violent crime in east lansing um, nor have I been on a ride along, but being on a ride along is on my to do list for after social distancing is over. I feel like right now is probably not the time to do that, but it is definitely something I'm interested in. Councilmember Meadows. Yes, I have. Not here, not in East Lansing or the Lansing area. I've been a victim of a violent crime. Um, I also have uh, been on a ride along and uh, watched our police officers on a very tough night and how they dealt with uh, large crowds of people. I'm a graduate of the East Lansing Citizen Police Academy, uh, which I consider to be uh, an excellent, uh, provide excellent insight into how the police department operates. And I would agree with the mayor that, um, you know, we do see a lot of stereotyping in, in the debate about how we're going to deal with this. You know, not all police are bad, uh, just like uh, all of anything is not bad. And we do have a tendency in the United States to sort of stereotype almost everything. So we do have a lot of work to do uh, you know, with regard to the current situation uh, that we're dealing with across the nation and in the city of East Lansing. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I have not a ride along. That was my only comment on that. All right, thank you, Ms. Bart. Um, I'm sorry. Were you finished with your? Oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Babcock. Jump up and down. <laughs> yes, thank you. I have been on ride alongs many, but not in the city of East Lansing. Um, I have been a victim of violent crimes more than once, not in the city of East Lansing. Um, about the Judge and jury, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to. Um, I have discussed that the council should have, may, may want to have an opportunity to override charges that have been issued, but I'd like to back that up for a minute. Um, I think that it's worth considering whether the city council should have the right to ask the prosecutor to not prosecute certain crimes. Um, if we find credible basis of, of um, credible allegations of racial discrimination, 
because this is how it works. An officer goes out, they do their investigation, they write their report. The report goes to the shift commander who then decides whether to send it to the prosecutor or whether to send it to a detective, in which case detectives does some work, it goes back to the shift commander. Charges are not issued by the police, the charges are issued by a prosecutor. Um, felonies in East Lansing are issued by the prosecutor in, in Bingham County. Some misdemeanors in East Lansing are issued by the prosecutor, excuse me, city attorney who prosecutes on our behalf. Uh, the city attorney is a direct employee of the city council. E when charges are brought, they're brought in the name of the people of the state of Michigan. So it's not an individual. However, we have seen at least one case recently where a similar series of action resulted in very different charges for two individuals and the notable difference was their skin color. This is not something that I would consider lightly and the community member who originally proposed it to me sees it as an extreme measure um, not something that we would do regularly, and we'd have to work around existing ordinances. So to do it, we'd have to create an exception for ourselves that I imagine would be extremely narrow. I don't think anyone wants to create a large exception. Um, ask me the time, I build you a watch. I'm sorry about that. You're more than welcome to email with me, um, lbabcock at cityofeastlansing.com or city council. And I want to apologize, I didn't catch your name. Uh, 194, if you're still on, I think you have some time left. Um, and Councilmember Babcock has asked you for your name, which you can give or not up to you. And also if we have answered your question or if you if you would like more clarification. And you may have Jamie, you may be muted. Jamie, sorry. I will seek clarification at a later time. Thank you so much. I don't well, want to go you. over. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cartel. Thank you, Mayor. The next caller on the list is phone number ending in 223. You may now address council 223. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yes, my name is Maple and um, I've heard your previous callers and I think there's some great information to be gained. Um, I'm very, very curious when you say you've done ride-alongs have you done them at two three in the morning when there's been significant events or were those in daytime hours i'll leave that question out there and the other thing as a long long time resident 34 years this young man stevenson you seem to have tried and convicted him mayor um the young man was cleared in two different investigations, yet you still publicly say you think he lied. Uh, I, I'm very disturbed by that. So you, you talk about an object or your uh, oversight committee. I, I think oversight committees are very valuable to give information, but where is where do these people have the knowledge base of police procedure to objectively decide abuse of force. That is very disturbing to me. What data do we have that indicates that East Lansing Police Department has a history of race issues, yet it seems to be thrown out there all the time? One of the one of your callers mentioned the Citizens Police Academy, and I remember talking to a gentleman from the NAACP who ended up, he was fervently against our police department, the police department East Lansing, and then reversed his ideas because he finally got to know them, ride with them, and actually became a supporter. So this is just like, um, I, I like the one caller said, it's like you tried and convicted this young man without a whole lot of data. And did the community, do we ask for, our input from the community or survey issues that we have with the police department? No, it's, it's just another edict. Um, I, I, I do think that, I think probably, and I don't know, because I don't know the East Lansing Police Department, but I imagine they are horrified by what happened 
but they're getting painted with the same picture and that officer Stevenson is getting persecuted to the point where if I was he or his attorney, I would consider slander. You're destroying his career. You're destroying other police officers within that department of ever seeking a career of justice because of what's been going on and because of the media and because of things that are just not true. So yes, I am concerned and if nothing else, mayor and city council, please, um, you, you need to really educate yourself. I'm not sure that you've done the necessary homework to see what East Lansing Police is about before you painted a picture. Uh, thank you. I will take the, ch the opportunity to answer your questions. Um, I agree with you that it will help when um, COVID is over to get to know the police officers um, more individually. My ride along was almost all night and there were quite a, quite a few parties. I mean, nothing dangerous. Nobody was shooting at each other. But I, I, have, I think you're right that it, it would certainly help to get to know um, officers and I plan to do so. Um, I'm sorry. Who's speaking right now? Oh, I'm, the mayor? I'm sorry. I'm sorry as well. This is the mayor. Uh, okay. Thank yeah. you. Yep. Um, in terms of... Think, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Do you so think it, perhaps that you've alienated them by your comments that they don't welcome any presence from you? Um, that may well be. They're not going to have a lot of choice about it, unfortunately, for them, I guess. Um, if if the mayor or any council member decides that they need to get to know the police better, I'm sure that the city manager would support us in that. But, but let me aren't we for the same thing? We want the community, the police and the community to interact and like each other and understand each other, but not force themselves on each other. But it sounds like that's exactly what you want to do. No, I was just answering your question about whether I thought it was a good idea to get the, to know the police better. And if I decide to do that, I will do that. But to answer your questions, we we actually do have data. We've only been collecting it for a few years, which, which I consider uh, partly the fault of city council, partly the fault of staff, partly the fault of the police themselves. We have never collected data by race. The, the data that we have collected shows that we do over police African Americans, meaning that we stop them more often than we stop um, people who are driving who are not African Americans. In terms of the Loggins arrest, which is, which is what my comments were about uh, when I said that the video appalled me, I challenge you to watch that video and have and have a different reaction. So I absolutely have, and I do, because my folks and my family has been brought up in police work. We understand police work. I don't think you have any idea what police work involves, and you're judging someone on your feelings that you have a, not a knowledge base on. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't mean to keep interrupting you, but I need to answer your questions um, before we go on. So my judgment is not based on my feelings and it's not a judgment. I watched the video and I was appalled. Now, it, it, if I had read a description of the video and not watched it, where the police officers took a, a 65 year old man out of a car for turning right out of a out of a gas station without using his signal ended up because he sat back down in his car not reaching for any weapon not showing that he had a weapon not being dangerous because he sat back down on his car he was grabbed and thrown forcibly to the ground held down with a knee very close to his neck had the officer at his head take his head in both of his hands and bash his face onto the ground twice, keep his knee on his neck after he was inert, say to the, to the older African-American man, stop struggling when he was inert and already handcuffed, finally turn him over and as he sit, sits him up, covers up his face because he knows it's being shown on the camera. 
those are the things that appalled me. And whether I understand, are you talking about whether Andy Stevenson? Let me finish. About but I please finish. Right. Whether I understand police work or not, I was speaking of my reaction to that video. I do believe you do have some time left, so go ahead. Okay, I, I guess I'm confused. Are you talking about the Andy Stevenson video or the other one that everyone pretty much clearly would agree was murder? I'm talking about the Andy Andy Stevenson video that are on the website um, uh, on the okay. Loggins the Loggins arrest which was in this, I think it's listed under Logan's arrest, if you want to watch it on the website. Oh, ma'am, in all respect, Mayor, I've watched it multiple times, and and I, I, I do know, and again, I understand East Lansing Police investigated it, and they may have some inherent bias, so I think it was smart to have the state police investigate it, and they exonerated him, but you seem to continue to persecute him. So to answer that question, the, the police, the state police did exonerate him. We sent the case to the state police. The state police sent us back a report saying that they did not find this outside of normal police behavior. And in that note, they said, has been referred to the um, county prosecutor. When we finally worked it out with the county prosecutor, we found that she had not ever actually seen the video. So she requested that if we wanted it to be reviewed, we send it to her, which we did. So at this point, it's being reviewed by a higher authority than the state police or even the county prosecutor and the attorney general is looking at, at that. We expected a decision relatively quickly. Um, Mr. Lahanis, do we have any indication of when we might get that decision? No, uh, Mr. Con uh, Captain Connolly's on the phone, so I asked him for an update, and he said at this point, we do not have uh, who that's been assigned to, so uh, I don't have a status at this point, but I've asked for a status update. I can ask Mr. Connolly on the phone if he's heard anything additionally. Chad, are you on the phone? I am, sir. I'm here in the meeting. I reached out this morning to the prosecutor's office, who had referred it to the attorney general. And as of today, before noon, they did not have an answer with which prosecutor it would be assigned to. Okay, thank you. Any more questions, 223? Yes, um, um, it's Maple, but that that is what's concerning. There was charges against that bad guy that, that bit the officer, which you said you didn't believe him. And you or the prosecutor is off to dismiss it because of the influence. And now it's being thought again. And she, the prosecutor, didn't even want to dismiss them, but she was overridden by Carol Seaman. I, this is just a railroad of injustice. I truly am the most diverse person and want racial justice, but I am so saddened by my community of 34 years to see you railroading this police officer and the rest of these police officers by just trying to make some irrational point because of the horrible death of Floyd. I, I, I just don't understand why you folks, you're not listening to data, you're not doing any research, you're not doing any community surveys, you're just reacting. And Thank that's you. exactly what racism is about is just a reaction and it's a horrible one which has caused horrible things to this country and i don't think the east lansing police department will ever rebound from this as well as the rest of us east lansing citizens it is despicable thank you mabel um one thing that about your, your your five minutes is up um i'm i'm informing you but one thing about your facts is you have them slight. You have them backwards in terms of the county prosecutor and the attorney general. The 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 attorney general did not override the county prosecutor. The county prosecutor never had the never had the opportunity to view the video. So no, you're correct. The prosecutor ended up the assistant prosecutor that issued the charges against the bad guy that bit Stevenson. She was told that she would drop those charges by Carol Seaman. That is wrong. That's that's actually incorrect. But thank you very much, Ms. Bartell. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. The next caller on the line is 
phone number ending in 753. Seven five three. You may now address council. And one more time, seven five three. It sounds like you're. Oh, hello. If you could mute your other device temporarily, and we can hear you now. Hello. Sorry about that. I, I think the video was a little bit behind. Um, no I'd first of all like to. Uh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, commending this city council for uh, standing up for the decision they may, uh, made, which uh, I believe is the right one. Um, I'm hearing a lot of people calling in saying that uh, the, the city council has uh, tried and uh, convicted this man already, um, yet he hasn't been tried as far as I know he hasn't been charged. Um, and I, I think it's, it's important to point out that this is, uh, I, I, I worry that uh, some of these people uh, saying that this is an effort to target police officers uh, are under the impression that this is some kind of adverse reaction to the death of George Floyd, like this is a response to a national movement. However, this is a conversation that has been going on long before George Floyd. Uh, we were having conversations about Officer Stevenson in February. Um, so I think the problem there is not necessarily that we're targeting the police. I think it's the people who are coming out here and blindly supporting the police are a bit late to uh, the occasion. Um, and they just don't have all the facts. And really the reason for that is because they are, for some very peculiar reason, I don't know, uh, just showing up now when a police officer is being affected by criminal justice actions. Uh, while for the past several months, uh, black people were being adversely affected by criminal justice actions. And I didn't, uh, I didn't hear any of these uh, folks call in. So um, I, uh, uh, I don't really know what to make of that. But anyway, uh, I'd again like to thank you all. Uh, Council Member Babcock, I think you hit it right on the nose. And Mayor Beyer, I, I really appreciated what you said uh, to the last caller. Um, now, I just have really two questions. Um, and the first one is, uh, we talked uh, a few weeks ago about Ingham County Jail. And I think uh, uh, the conversation is, it, it, I'm, I'm very glad that it's happening. I think that's very productive. Um, but uh, I, I think it should be focused on less where we house people and more just looking into the treatment of people in, in Ingham County in general. I know you don't have the power to decide what goes on there, but I think it's very important that we take that next step in the conversation about criminal justice reform. And I think a good place to start would be discussing with the officials who are in charge of Ingham County uh, Jail, whether that be through the Michigan Corrections Department or some other body, uh, how they use solitary confinement. I have spoken with lots of people in Ingham County Jail who have uh, uh, suffered at the hands of uh, what I believe to be unjust use of solitary confinement, such as uh, putting someone in the hole for writing a complaint. So I would just like to uh, uh, a pledge from all of you uh, that that uh, a conversation along those lines could be started, uh, perhaps at the next meeting um, or even in preparation for the next meeting. We could open a line of dialogue uh, with the officials in Ingham County Jail. Okay, um, I, I'm I'm actually going to ask Mr. Lahanas if he will. Uh, put that on the next, uh, actually, will you put that on the agenda? I think that might be appropriate for the um, retreat. Oh, actually, maybe not, because that's really not a nice Lansing issue. I got you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, in one second, but okay, we'll go to Mayor Pro Tem. What's your, what's your thought there? No, my, my only thought is I'd just like to request more information from the caller. Um, if there can be something in writing uh, sent to council at cityofeastlansing.com, just to give us a little bit more context. Um, I've heard some things anecdotally here or there, but, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to, to at least if we're going to have a discussion at the next meeting, maybe hear some, some more info or maybe point us in the direction of resources that we can direct the city manager to reach out to on this, um, just because I want to, I want to be in the know before we had the conversation. And, and I'm, I'm I'd, I'd be happy to. 
Sorry, um, I, and I'm also committed to looking at the issue. I'm not sure if we could do it at the next meeting. That's what I was going to ask Mr. Lahanas to look at. Um, Ms. Councilmember Gregg and then Councilmember Meadows, did you have your hand up? Yes, um, shake yeah, your hand. I, I think this is Ed Brushton on the line. I don't know if you told us yeah, your name. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, Ed, I wasn't sure if you were aware that Ingham County Board of Commissioners tonight is actually looking at creating a regional racial equity task force um, specifically to address some of the um, more public uh, aspects of racial equity that have come out, including criminal reform. Um, I, I oh. fully expect that that will pass the Ingham County Board of Commission tonight. It's actually a meeting that's happening concurrently with this one. Um, Darrell okay, Slatter, okay. the... Um, Send me the proposed resolution. If you'd want me to send it along to you, you can um, send me your email address through the council email and I will forward this to you, but I think you will be pleased. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Yeah, excellent. Um, and I just had one more question, um, if, if, if there's a little bit of time. It's just a quick one. Um, uh, while we're, uh, uh, you know, hoping to, to kind of broaden the conversation, um, since there was a duty to intervene on the books, uh, can I, uh, uh, could, could I open a dialogue right now and just get to each of your thoughts on whether or not we should consider um, uh, investigating officers Nelson and Seaman uh, for uh, violating uh, duty to intervene? I'm not saying that they 100% did. However, the language was, if feasible, you can attempt uh, to intervene in excessive force. And I think it was, it was pretty clear that uh, uh, the, the, it was feasible to attempt uh, in that situation. So I was wondering if I could get your thoughts on uh, whether or not investigating officers Nelson and Seaman would be a good idea. So my thoughts are to wait until we hear back from the Attorney General, um, and then I am open to that idea. Anybody else? Okay. Councilmember Greg? Um, yeah, I think speaking to that point, I think, um, and kind of to include some of the comments from the previous callers, um, speaking specifically uh, to Council Ste um, Officer Stevenson's um, accusations in this case, to me, the problem um, with those videos is that that level of violence has been cleared as legal by two different agencies at this point. And so to me, okay. the question is not particularly um, whether or not that particular officer in that instance was acting excessively, but to me, it is a evidence of the entire system really needing to be addressed and the level of enforcement that we use um, legally across the board as much as the individual officers. And so I think, you know, asking officers to intervene in something that has now been too, cleared by two different law enforcement agencies as legal level of force I don't think that we can expect that to be an expectation, but I think that we can go back and look at the authorized level of force and take it from this idea that the system needs to be addressed. Councilmember Greg, not that you asked the question, but um, there is a higher authority looking at it now and they could have yes. a different. Yes, okay. absolutely. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stevens. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment um, off of what Councilmember Greg said and kind of off of what some of the other folks have been saying. I mean, when we're talking about like public safety here, um, you know, and I think one person made a comment of if we're just going to let people go um, with um, committing crimes in East Lansing, I, I just, I, I've said this before and I'll, and I'll say it again and maybe folks just weren't on the last call. I, I just, I can't imagine a situation in which a, somebody who is not a danger to themselves or somebody else um, who has a, a missed a turn signal coming out of a parking lot um, and might be driving while their license is suspended um, and that can be dealt with an appearance ticket. I, I don't think that that's a public safety issue. I truly don't. At least it's not a public safety issue that extends to the fact that we need to arrest somebody over it. Um, and that's not in reference to violent crime um, as I think that a lot of people like to make that reference. What we're talking about is like over enforcing of our own policies and that's not necessarily a police thing that's more of a policy maker things but um you know when we're talking about public safety in general we really need to take a hard look at what do we count as public safety because we just went through our disorderly conduct ordinance last meeting and i would argue that many of the things that counted as public safety before that meeting do not count as public safety now and so you know i, I would implore people that are listening to just you know um take a 
take a step back and realize that, you know, maybe somebody walking through a park suspiciously might not be a concern for police officers. And that's not something that's on the officer. That's something that is really a, a bigger question about the criminal justice system in general. So, um, but that was just more of council member Greg's comments, not necessarily in relation to this caller. So, but I am open to that conversation caller. All right, well, that sounds three. fantastic. All right, sorry. I was going to ask if there's anything more. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I think uh, I, I, I really appreciate um, uh, you answer my questions and uh, it sounds like uh, uh, we can have a pretty productive discussion about Ingham County going forward. Uh, Councilmember Greg, thank you for that uh, uh, tip about uh, the Board of Commissioners and I know I've been pretty stubborn with you guys recently, um, but it is encouraging to see when um, this kind of wave of, of folks who are coming in sounding sort of like uh, 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 where uh, the, the city is is uh, waging war on the police or, or antagonizing the police. I think it's it's uh, mistaken, and I, I really appreciate uh, uh, your uh, committed work to this because I really think that that this is a, a group that is very supportive of the police, and I don't mean that in any kind of bad uh, context at all. And um, I, I think it's very good to be uh, uh, in support of those who are trying to, who are putting their lives on the line to keep the peace in this community. And I think this isn't any kind of attack on police. I think it's just patching up uh, a place in the criminal justice process and our criminal justice process where we saw injustice. There was no idea of going after anybody or taking names. And uh, I, I, I really appreciate the work you've all done. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bartel. Thank you, Mayor. The next caller on the line is phone number ending in 432. You may now address council. Hi, am I here? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for taking my call tonight. Um, I, uh, this is Chuck Grigsby, um, East Lansing resident. Um, I, I've been listening to the calls here um, tonight and I, um, I must say just to some of the callers, you know, most officers are good, uh, but many of them aren't. And we need to do something about the ones that aren't. And um, I know for the people that I've talked with, worked with and advocated for um, are not necessarily going after any particular person or any particular department as far as police officers are in general. So I just really want to put that on the record when it comes to that. Um, I would like to give uh, uh, a compliment to George Lahanis um, for hiring uh, Elaine Hardy um, as the first um, diversity, equity, inclusion administrator. I believe that she's uh, uh, someone who's been in the community for a long time, who has the ability to uh, fill that role and do very, very well at that. So I was very pleased to see that. And um, uh, on a side note, uh, Aaron Stevens, I, I know I know this is uh, you know, maybe something that's on the side, but I was wondering if we could address um, changing the Human Relations uh, Commission's name to the Human Rights Commission. I didn't know if this was the format to do that, but that's something that came up to my mind when I was uh, calling in tonight. Um, also, um, I just had a quick question. I was talking to a community member uh, in regards to uh, your resolution, um, Mrs. Babcock, in regards to uh, the referral uh, when there is a complaint. I just wanted to know how um, this is going to work with the internal investigation process as far as them not releasing information until they have the investigation complete and how that was going to work into your resolution if that hasn't been addressed uh, so far already. Um, lastly, uh, the Lansing City Council began to replace a resolution declaring racism as a public health crisis. Um, and it's very symbolic in nature, but um, it was just really, you know, a commitment to implicit bias when it comes to some of the people in the community. I just want to know what you guys thought about that if that was something that you would be interested in um, as well as following suit. Um, and I don't know if that's been done in some form or fashion or not in East Lansing, but I just thought that that was a great symbolic uh, way to be able to kind of really uh, have that as uh, classified as a public health issue um, based on some of the things that have been happening in the community. Over there, they have some different things that are going on with disproportionate levels of health issues, reduced, reduced life expectancy, some things like that that come up to play with that. But for us, um, we have a history of housing discrimination. Uh, we have some incidents happening at the MSU campus, uh, and we have some police, community policy issues when it comes to that. 
And so I just thought maybe um, that that resolution was a great way to be able to kind of do that officially as far as uh, declaring racism as a public health issue. Um, I don't have any direct questions, but I do want to also say that change um, in leadership sometimes is um, uh, misunderstood and difficult and lonely in some ways. And I just really appreciate uh, uh, from since we've been talking with some of these issues in January up to this point, um, I see a lot of you grow um, in your perspective, grow in your understanding and grow in your willingness to commit to some very tough, complex issues. Uh, you have people calling in today uh, on both sides of the uh, table who feel very strongly about uh, what's going on. And, and you know, that I guess that's the reason why you guys are sitting in the chairs to be able to handle that. And I commend you because it's not easy work. And I look forward to um, um, seeing you guys work really hard within this um, retreat that's designed to come up. I don't know if what, what the plans is, if you guys are going to, um, have a retreat and then come back and address some of these different things, or are you going to address some of these different things in the retreat and come back? I just would like to know how that's going to work so we can be a part of that process as well um, when it comes to what you guys are working on and hopefully have input as well when it comes to that. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to call on the people who were asked, uh, Council uh, Mayor Pro Tem, then Council Member Babcock, then Council Member Greg, and then Mr. Lahanas, I'm going to ask you where we are in planning the retreat. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor Byer. Um, yes, uh, Chuck, I'm very open to that, as you probably recall, and but I'll give a um, an explanation to the rest of the council. Um, the Human Relations Commission has done a heck of a lot of work um, and expanded their role, I think, almost tenfold over the past couple of years in terms of um, pushing policy, um, looking at um, their own agenda for uh, equity within the city of East Lansing, hosting events, sponsoring things. And so um, a conversation arose um, at the HRC a number of months ago, um, pre-COVID, um, where we had uh, talked about um, the possibility of allocating um, a consistent budget towards the HRC um, to sponsor events as they have in the past. Of course, they have usually come to council to request that. Um, but they have been doing that for the past couple of years. And since they have been um, hosting events such as coffee hours and different things in the community to talk about individual protected classes, um, a conversation arose on maybe this should be a standardized thing, something that's actually in the role of what the HRC does. Um, and, uh, and in that conversation, the, of course, the name Human Relations Commission also came up um, and we were hoping to change that to Human Rights Commission. I will say we have not met in a bit. And my hope was that um, if we were to make a change, um, we would be doing that with um, more than just a name change. We would also be doing that with um, some, some other role changes for the HRC. But um, Chuck, I'd be more than happy to just talk about that at the HRC meeting that's happening next week, July 1st, um, and then hopefully bring something to council after that. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Council Member Babcock. Thank you. Um, two thoughts. The agenda, the, uh, the item that was originally posted on the agenda, I think I clipped or failed to save properly. So Human Relations Commission will now receive a copy of everything the city council gets in addition to the study committee. Um, to be honest, I, I welcome thoughts on how the Human Relations Commission wants to go ahead. What most of this proposal would do is a guarantee that complaints are seen by city council so we don't find out after the fact. Um, it guarantees that Human Relations sees it, the study committee sees it. Um, the study committee in part because it will be creating a process so knowing what those complaints are can be useful as you shape a process. Um, if they aren't useful, you can, you're welcome, just go ahead and delete. Um, it also creates a process outside of the police contract for looking at these, but balancing that really tough spot, um, as I've drafted it, I don't believe it kind of, I don't believe it contradicts the police contract, but it allows the equity officer and the human resources person to make a recommendation to the police chief within seven days. 
Um, I've said from the beginning, this is in addition to, not instead of, and it, it's a start. So we're going to start talking about it tonight. I don't know how far we'll go. We may be talking about this a few weeks from now. Um, Mr. Grigsby, I, we, we've traded some emails and um, this goes for anyone as well. My, my phone number, my email, anytime. Okay, but preferably email. Uh, my phone gets eaten by gremlins. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be flippant about a serious subject, but thank you. Thank you, Council Member Greg. Um, I wanted to speak to um, Mr. Grigsby's question regarding the resolution to recognize racism as a public health crisis. Um, that was very much on my to-do list. And then Daryl Slaughter beat me to the punch today and um, reached out and asked if we were gonna do it. So now doubly important to me that we move forward. Um, so to that end, I had him send me the resolution that Ingham County passed um, so that I can kind of use that as a starting point. I was going to read through it and make sure that it was pertinent to East Lansing before forwarding that to um, probably bring it up at, I mean, I, I don't know if we need to discuss it or if I should just draft it and pass it. I guess you guys can kind of decide about that. But um, yes, so that's in the plan for sure. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lahanis, where are we on retreat planning? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so I, I got you, Mr. Meadows. Oh. After, after Mr. Lahanis. Go ahead, Mr. Lahanis. Okay. So I've had a detailed discussion with Lane Hardy, and she's taken it back to the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee to select a facilitator to um, lay out a schedule for us, a draft schedule, draft facilitator. And then we want to bring it back to council pretty quickly and have you guys begin selecting dates that you're available starting in July. So we're going to try to do perhaps a once a month, and it will be over several months, uh, beginning with uh, retreat and training on um, anti-bias and anti-racism, and then going into diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it's going to be hopefully all laid out um, in a draft. So council obviously will have the final say, but having that committee lay it out, select a potential facilitator because um, obviously uh, which want to get going on this pretty quickly. So the goal will still be in July to have something possible and hopefully soon we can do some sort of a poll for council to see what days will um, work for the group. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Grisby, Grisby in terms of uh, getting community input on what we're going to do at our retreat, we don't have a timeline for that, but I would ask you if you have particular ideas, ideas to email them to all of us. And we are going to have a community component of the retreat itself. Uh, we just haven't figured out how, how we're going to do that yet. Uh, Council Member Meadows. It's the red button. Uh, the, uh, I just wanna respond to, to uh, Jesse's um, suggestion. I, I really think it'd be easy to, to conform that uh, Ingham County resolution to make certain that it makes reference to East Lansing, you know, where it refer, refers to Ingham County. It may be something that we want to talk about, but really, for my, in, in my opinion, that's just something to put on the consent agenda because I can't see why we would not do that. I mean, clearly, we do want to do that. And also, uh, with regard to Aaron's comments uh, and Chuck's with regard to the Human Rights, Human Rights Commission, I think that's a great idea. And if it will take a much longer time to, to actually uh, put more meat on the bones uh, in terms of changes that we might wanna make to uh, responsibilities of what is now the Human Relations Commission, then uh, it's another thing where I say, let's just make that change. You know, if that's the starting point, let's just get it done. Uh, I don't think it's controversial in any way whatsoever. I think we just need to do it. That's yeah. it. I tend to agree with you, uh, Mr. Meadows. Mr. Gris Gripsby, is, I think you have another few seconds left if, if you have anything else. Oop. No, I just really appreciate you. I really appreciate you guys' time um, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. And uh, we're watching and we're looking for those great results. So thank you so much. Take care. Ms. Bartell. Thank you, Mayor. The next caller on the list is phone number ending in 534. You may now address council 534. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, my name is Ann Hill and I've lived in East Lansing for 14 years. 
I'd like to comment tonight on my concern about the unexpectedly high number of actual police department retirees compared to the budgeted number. Uh, as you'll remember, in 2018, the voters in the city of East Lansing approved an income tax. And that income tax had three specified components along with the timeline. 60% to pension payments, primarily police and fire, 20% police and fire protection, and 20% infrastructure improvements. Approval of this tax demonstrated the public's value of our police and fire personnel. By not approving the initiative until a specified timeline was included, it demonstrated a lack of confidence by the voters that future city leadership, being council and staff, would faithfully spend those funds consistent with the public's priorities. We, the voters of the city of East Lansing, approved of funding those in our public safety department who are and have been in the past willing to stand in harm's way to keep our community safe. Clearly, our cause for concern was valid, as within two years, our city council is now calling for defunding the police. Please do not misunderstand. I am not saying there should be no oversight of these departments and the personnel. We are dealing with human nature, and human nature is flawed. We have bad, if we have bad apples, then those individuals must be addressed but do not demonize and demoralize the entire group. For those individuals who are choosing to retire now, they'll need to be replaced. Their retirements will result in a significant amount of experience going with them. Experience is crucial in good decision-making and is something that only comes with time. And in the case of our public safety personnel, that assessment needs to be done accurately and quickly daily as they do their job. A newly certified individual will not automatically have the experience necessary to make the most accurate decisions possible while a situation is unfolding and should be supported in gaining that skill set. We need to keep this in mind going forward. We used to call our public safety personnel peace officers. Now they're referred to as law enforcement. There's a very different connotation with each, with each of these titles. As we look for replacement officers and supporting personnel, which will probably come from newly certified, less experienced applicants, I ask that we also look at an area that I have not heard much conversation and dialogue about. What are the institutions, our universities, colleges, and various continued education programs teaching? A recent article from Eli showed two photos from May 31st of Michigan State University police vehicles, along with personnel that I would expect to find in a war or a military zone, not in a local community. If the university owns and uses these vehicles and tools, they are clearly teaching on how to use them images matter. And what be behaviors are the residents and visitors coming to our city exhibiting? Both sides have a responsibility in this. As I mentioned, we are dealing with human nature here. Just because people are told to do something, even when it's in the best interest of the community, it does not mean they are willing to comply. Think back to the very early stages of the pandemic, before we had much data, and before MSU's in-person classes were suspended. Students packed the local bars and restaurants with little to no regard for social distancing or masks. MSU encouraged the students to return to their hometowns, and the city of East Lansing was put under a state of emergency. Despite being under a state of emergency, the rioters that came to the cities of Lansing and East Lansing didn't comply either. I would like to take this time to commend and thank the city's public safety department for allowing the protesters to peaceably assemble. There is not a quick fix to this situation. Let's look at the various aspects of this complex situation and be sure to address all of them. Defunding the police is not what the voters of the city of East Lansing told the city government they wanted. In fact, we voted for the exact opposite. I am asking this council to represent the people of East Lansing's wishes and their priorities and not your own. We want a safe city to raise our families and to provide opportunities for jobs to be able to put food on the table and a roof over our heads. I ask the city council to expand their search for solutions to this issue to include examining the training protocols our up and coming public safety personnel are being taught at our outside educational institutions, universities and colleges, and to examine the content of continued education training programs being funded by federal and state grants. I also ask that you do not let fear and chaos rule the day. Solutions you have 30 seconds result. remaining. Solutions should be a result of clear, level-headed thinking. This situation did not evolve overnight, and it will not be resolved overnight. Thank you for your time and your consideration of these comments. Thank you. Ms. Bartell. Oh, sorry. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stevens and then Councilmember Meadows. So I had a couple of things to address with this. Um, so um, I, 
I will try to unpack in the best way that I can, but I'll start with a comment that was made at the end. So one of the things that was mentioned was looking at training and de-escalation and, and some other things in regards to how police are actually trained and what the images are that we're, that we're displaying there. And the thing that I will say in a conversation that we had um, and a conversation around defunding the police in general centers around the fact that that's usually just not enough. Um, having a conversation about training or extra trainings um, when we had the conversation around eight can't wait, de-escalation and different things, um, we ended up going through a list and yes, there were some changes, but we ended up going through a list of things um, that to all accounts, we actually followed at this point, yet we're still not okay with how we are acting in a public safety role. And I think that's the point. And when you're talking about um, really, you know, what is public safety in the city of East Lansing? I think that's the entire point of talking about defunding the police is reimagining that. It's why you push for things like social workers that are embedded in the force because, you know, and to speak to an earlier situation where somebody asked me if I was on a ride along very late at night, I can tell you, and I bet that a couple of officers know the situation that I'm talking about. There was a situation on Abbott Road where I know an apartment probably could have used a social worker instead of an officer because the officer didn't know how to handle the situation. And there probably isn't training to handle a lot of situations that officers handle, no matter how much training we would give. That's the point is that we really need to rethink public safety. And I think what the voters voted for is to have a safe community. And if we need to rethink that, and if we need to reimagine what public safety looks like, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with having that conversation. Um, and to the point is that's, that's a conversation happening across the entire country right now. There's no model necessarily for this. There's a lot of cities doing a lot of really great things, a lot of cities imagining what we can do, um, and a lot of really educated people when they say the words defunding the police, that does not mean we just take a budget allocation away and put it in another pot like parks. It means that we are rethinking and reimagining and really diving into radical change on what public safety means. And I think that's important because when you get to the point of having police officers respond to things that they can't actually handle, not because of incompetence, but because they don't have the training or necessary education to handle it, that's a problem. And that's gonna to lead to bad situations. And I could have a further conversation about over-policing and our own policies and laws that lead to those decisions. But at the end of the day, that's what this conversation is about. And so I will say that I really hope, um, and I might be mistaken by this, that the voters of East Lansing voted for a safe community. And I think that safety applies to everybody in the community, especially those most vulnerable. So if we're trying to, trying to find how we get to a point where people feel like they are safe regardless of their color, skin tone, religion, sexual orientation, or any of the other protected classes, I think that's a valid conversation to have. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Stevens. Uh, Councilmember Meadows. Yeah, uh, just piggyback a little bit there because I think that what Aaron points out there uh, most clearly is that uh, Anne, I think, is thinking of the word defunding in terms of its traditional um, definition. But what has really been said across the nation is that we need to examine how we provide public safety services through a police department within each community. I don't, I don't remember us, uh, I think she began her comments by indicating that the council had you know, sort of adopted the idea that we were gonna defund the police department. I don't remember us doing that for one thing, but I also do remember, and I think it is very appropriate for us to examine how the police department does everything. I mean, there is nothing there that we shouldn't take a look at. I will say from my standpoint, I think we should periodically do that with every department of city government, because I think we can always find areas that we can improve. So I want to just say, I believe that it is our obligation to examine the police department in all aspects, how officers are deployed, how they are trained, the content of that training, the type of thing that we want to see done and within the city, how we wanna provide public services, where people provide public services and where there are ways for us to reduce the number of police officers that we might have on the, on the uh, ground by using other personnel as well. We just heard, you know, I think Jesse brought up uh, this week an issue where a police officer responds to the the uh, conflict between middle-aged citizens who want to play pickleball and and uh, 
who want to play um, whatever it was, tennis, golf, or, or tennis, soccer. And um, we send a police officer, we're really a park officer who's unarmed, who has a different approach to this would probably be most appropriate. So those are the type of things that I think we're looking at that we should be looking at and that we will be looking at. And I, I, I don't think it's all about, as Aaron said, taking uh, whatever the $13 million that we spend on the police department and putting it someplace else. That's not what where our plan is. Thank you. Um, anybody else? All right, Ms. Bartell. Thank you, Mayor. The next caller on the line is um, area code. I'm going to do area code and the last three digits since we have two callers with the last three digits, but this is area code 517 and the last three digits are 660. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Hey, um, it's me, Farhan, and I want to thank you guys for answering my call. Um, I'm just, I've been sitting over here and just hearing everyone call in and try to make this seem like as if it is you know, the East Lansing Police Department versus the people, if it is, if we're somehow like anti-police and that is not the case. You know, there's this notion that Officer Stevenson has been caught in this big web or in this big movement that, that is currently taking place in our country. And that is far from the fact. Um, Officer Andrew Stevenson, in the last, since 2018, he has had he has accounted for 42% of all public complaints. Officer Stevenson has been accused of excessive force within a six week period. First, he did it to Anthony Logan Jr. And then he did it to Mr. Gacito. Officer Andrew Stevenson has had five complaints made against him by men of color since 2018. Um, so this isn't just about the East Lansing Police Department. It is more so about one individual that has terrorized the African-American community. This is a man that his number one priority was to hunt for black people. And I am glad we finally brought that to the community's attention. I am glad that city council members have stood up and said, you know what, that, that is enough. The officer that killed George Floyd in his personal file he had 18 complaints against him, 18 complaints. You know, if the right people had been watching, if the right people had been listening, if the right people had been acting, George Floyd might still be breathing today. That is what we're trying to prevent from happening here in East Lansing. We don't want a black man to be killed by Officer Andrew Stevenson. And if we don't act, if, if we're gonna be reactive, and not proactive, then another black man is gonna die at the hands of police. But this time, it's gonna be right here in East Lansing. You know, people wanna bring up Officer Andrew Stevenson being cleared by the state police, but it is, it is the state police that sent warrant requests to the county prosecutor. It is literally them that said, hey, this is what we found after we looked at everything. So has it, did they really exonerate him when they sent warrant request for the county prosecutor and then now the county prosecutor has forwarded that warrant to the attorney general which according to the captain hasn't been assigned a special prosecutor yet so you know andrew stevenson has hired a lawyer by the name of mike and mike is literally throwing the notion that officer stevenson is being punished because of a big movement off listen <laughs> his lawyer mike he's a wannabe michael Avenatti. And Mike, if you don't know who Michael Avenatti is, Michael Avenatti was the lawyer for Stormy Daniels. And that is who Mike is. He's a lawyer. He's being paid by Andrew Stevenson. So he will do whatever it takes to discredit everything that we have done and everything we have worked for. You know, this mayor of East Lansing, <laughs> she's not anti-police. In fact, when Mr. Gacito's case was presented to the public, it was this mayor that publicly thanked the police. It was this mayor that wrote a letter to the police and their police chief, then chief Larry, and publicly thanked them. So I know she's not anti-police, but when she sees bullshit, she's gonna call on it. 
and it is her job to do that. It is her job to protect everybody. It is, it is the job of the city council to make sure they represent everyone. And for many years, the 8%, the 8% African-American community in East Lansing has not been represented. And it is time that we change that. I know there's a lot of people that are, that are there to defend Andrew Stevenson, and they're probably gonna get their facts from the lawyer or some fake news resource, but sources. But the fact is, Andrew Stevenson is not just a bad apple. Andrew Stevenson is a racist. Andrew Stevenson needs to be fired. Andrew Stevenson needs to be charged. You have 30 seconds remaining. And, and that is a fact. So do not let a lawyer intimidate you guys. Do not let lawyers try to tell you guys how to do your job. It is your job to represent everyone in the city of East Lansing. Now, I have a few questions for um, Mr. Lahanis and for the mayor and for the city council, in fact. Um, for Mr. Lahanis, my question is, where are we uh, in, uh, for uh, our next police chief? Um, what, Mayor, well, I did uh, want to point out that the time is up. Just so you um, know. Yeah, Farah, um, we have quite a few questions tonight, so we're going to go ahead and get through those. Um, Ms. Bartow, will you call the next caller, please? What? Yes. Um, the next caller on the line is phone number ending in 961. Good evening. This is the infamous Mike, Mike Nichols business owner in this city since 2006, a resident of the community, former resident of East Lansing, Michigan State University graduate. Uh, yes, uh, I am Andrew Stevenson's lawyer, and I am very proud of that fact. We don't have to take every case, and I certainly would not have taken this case had I not had over nine plus years working on the other side from Officer Stevenson. As uh, some people may know, I am a criminal defense attorney uh, focusing on drunk driving defense. I've had many battles with the East Lansing Police Department and in fact with the uh, city of East Lansing. And I certainly welcome that last caller to contact me if he wishes to discuss uh, this matter and, and my views of my client. I, I wanna take the time and, and I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on what I originally had planned to say because you've heard uh, some uh, really uh, impactful statements from some people who've been affected by uh, Andrew Stevenson, especially Diane, uh, the first speaker tonight. And, and I want to tell you something that I think probably bespeaks Andrew Stevenson's character more than any other observation I've made. And I've really only gotten to know him personally in the week that I've been representing him. And that is, he never told me about that life-saving episode with his uh, fellow public servants. He's never told me anything about going to the hospital to track down the gentleman and his wife to find their house so he could go pray over the house and to go back and visit them. I had to find that out from officers who came to me, who I've been on the other side of on cases, who wanted to make sure I knew about the measure of this man and the, the content of his uh, character. Uh, I, I do want to point out something, uh, Mayor. I, I think the posture of this case with Mr. Stevenson has been inaccurately described. Um, it is currently not with the Attorney General's office. It will be referred to a special prosecutor under a statute in the state of Michigan. And the Attorney General has a role in assigning the special prosecutor, but, but that's all. And I did speak with the chief assistant prosecutor this evening, and I am told that uh, that has not um, come to fruition yet. We do not have a special prosecutor assigned yet. The only reason it was sent out by Carol Seaman for review by a special prosecutor is she did not feel comfortable uh, doing it in her office, which I can appreciate. That's nothing that's unusual. And furthermore, the fact that the Michigan State Police took a warrant request to the prosecutor's office, that is standard procedure. The last line that you'll see on that report that was disclosed publicly by the city should say TOT, which means turned over to prosecutor, because law enforcement can't just unilaterally say, I'm not sending this to a prosecuting official for review. And I, I want to point out, uh, Mayor Byer, and, and with respect, I mean, 30 years ago, I was that young man, Ed, 
I've had um, questions about government and authority all my life. That's my background. That's who I am. That's what I do for a living. I have watched a lot of those videos and those videos are hard to watch. And many times I would have probably had the same response that you had to what happened with Officer Stevenson. And I want to point out as a point of fact, he's not the one who made the traffic stop. He had to go back up Officer Nelson. He's not the one who made the decision to put that gentleman under custodial arrest. That was his fellow officer. But when that man got in the car, Mr. Loggins, that's an act of active resistance. And the reason is because the officer can't stand there and ask him what's in the car. He's he's at the complete caprice of the decision making of that person, that stranger who he's meeting for the first time. And I know I'm down to 45 seconds. And if you look at that video carefully and you talk to experts, you will understand that that's just simply what they're trained to do the procedures that he used and the techniques that he used. And I implore you, I beg you off, uh, Mayor Beyer, talk to experts. And when we get the final report from the special prosecutor, and I, I'm confident that Mr. Stevenson will be cleared, consider very carefully, keep an open mind about what you say publicly about this gentleman. We have hardworking civil servants in this city. Many of them are police officers, one of the best one of the best people and one of the best officers is Andrew Stevenson. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Ms. Bartell. Thank you, Mayor. The next caller on the list is phone number ending in 981. Hello, I'm a East Lansing resident. I just wanna echo what Mr. Nichols said, reference to seeing it from the officer's point of view that traffic stop with uh, Mr. Loggins, basically the officer does not know what's inside the vehicle. And normally a person who's under arrest complies and their first instinct or instinct isn't to jump inside the vehicle where the officers have no idea what's inside it. Uh, fortunately, there, there weren't any weapons, but at the time the officers did not know. And also the characterization by the mayor to say that the, Mr. Loggins was arrested for making a, a without or for not signaling signaling his turn, he was I believe he was arrested for driving while his license was suspended. I just think when you're a public official, you know, representing the city of East Lansing, you should put out the facts and not misinformation. Uh, that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you. I, I stand corrected about what he was eventually arrested for. I, I did misspeak. I meant that he was originally pulled over for um, not signaling coming out of the gas station and subsequently it was determined to find that he had an expired license. Thank you for clearing that up. Um, Ms. Bartell. Thank you, Mayor. The next caller, um, again, this is the repeat number. So this one is area code 586 and the last three digits are 660. Um, thanks, can y'all hear me? Yes, thank you. Um, good evening, y'all. Uh, my name is Dustin Hunt. I'm an East Lansing resident. Um, and in light of, you know, protests happening globally, um, in light of white people, waking up to the reality of systemic racism and ongoing brutality against um, communities of color. Um, in light of citizens taking a, a closer look at city operating budgets and realizing their police departments are disproportionately funded compared to everything else in their cities, um, I think uh, ELPD needs to be looked at critically and reimagined uh, wholly. Um, and to clarify, I'm not trying to discredit good people doing a hard job. Policing is an incredibly hard job. Um, rather, I'm, I'm personally concerned with policing as a whole and how it perpetuates systemic racism, benefits white folks. Um, I as well watched body cam footage of officers pulling over, beating up, arresting uh, Mr. Loggins that began with a failure to signal. Um, that sequence of events doesn't 
doesn't make sense. Um, clearly, this incident is worthy of an investigation. It's overtly violent, racist, discriminatory. Um, I want to point out some things that may have gone unnoticed. Um, when an officer was shining his flashlight looking in the trunk of Mr. Loggins, he was told to stop by Mr. Loggins. And the officer claimed he was not searching through the trunk. Um, and I would say in that moment, the officer lied, and this might seem inconsequential, but I, it's not. Um, this erodes the trust between residents and officers, officers who hold lots of power. Um, when the citizen shared his health concerns to officers and expressed discomfort while being pinned to the ground by multiple officers, um, they told him he wouldn't be in this position if he had behaved correctly. Um, and it's this mindset that is problematic. When officers, officers can just lie, intimidate, bully, threaten, justify their negligence and scripting their own incident reports, um, this, this is a serious issue. Aside from overt brutality, um, ELPD are able to wield power over East Lansing visitors, students, residents in ways that are troubling and I would say undermine public safety. Uh, when a department's only aim is to ensure public safety and they go about doing so with armed police officers with important yet limited skill sets and a certain level of immunity and power, um, how effective is this in establishing public safety? Um, what preventative measures are, and community development efforts are in place to support public safety? Um, in my opinion, if black and brown folks avoid East Lansing out of fear of racial profiling or discrimination, this is a public safety issue that ELPD cannot remedy. If black and brown folks do not feel safe in East Lansing with or without police present, this is a, pub a public safety issue that again, cannot be remedied by police. Um, if you haven't already, I suggest folks that are tuned in and council members um, look into the history of uh, the history and the function of policing in this country. Um, I also suggest folks look into alternative models of supporting true public safety, um, especially for communities of color. Um, as was mentioned before, Ingham County recently declared racism a public health emergency. Um, I would say policing as we know it perpetuates systemic racism and therefore undermines public health. Um, and I would, I would urge y'all to seek counsel from public health experts and organizations working to protect the health and wellness of communities of color. Um, I think we're living in extraordinary times right now and citizens are demanding the status quo, take big actionable steps to support the health, wellness and survival of black and brown folks in our communities. Yes, I urge council That's members right. and the mayor, I urge council members and the mayor um, and residents to support actionable steps to make East Lansing a better, safer, more appealing, more relevant, and more vibrant place for communities of color. There's too much to lose by tiptoeing forward with simple reformative measures. We need radical change. Um, and with that, I just wanna say thanks for taking the time to hear me out and um, consider my comments. And with that, I yield my time. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Bartell. Thank you, Mayor. The next caller on the list is phone number ending in 662. <laughs> number 662, there's an echo. I'm wondering if you have another device that may need to be muted in the background. And at this time, I'll unmute you again to address council if you'd like. Yes. Um, Thank you. This is uh, Crystal Davis, East Lansing resident. I do want to, again, uh, thank the council for the, the work and growth that they've had over the last month with regards to um, uh, policing in this community. Um, I think that it is disheartening how um, uh, individuals have limited scope on what occurred um, with uh, the officer that's in question. Um, I do ask that you guys look at it from a, a more compassionate and empathetic viewpoint um, and imagine that that was your child or you in that situation. And I think that the, um, 
what, um, you know, several people have hint hinted at is uh, the normalization of the uh, excessiveness uh, of use, excessive force of use. Um, and it is um, power dynamics and it's, it is abusive. So um, I think that's a larger issue at hand. And I, I ask that, you know, our community members who have uh, spoken in support of, of the officer um, to, again, reevaluate your values, uh, put yourself in um, that, that those, you know, two gentlemen's shoes um, and imagine that that was your, your child or your dad or yourself um, being mishandled um, and abused by that officer. And so, um, but anyhow, again, I think uh, the council for, uh, you know, going against the grain um, and being uh, leaders, the four leaders in this approach of, uh, you know, police reform. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Crystal. Um, Mr. Stevens. Mr. Stevens. Yeah, I'd just like to make a note um, and thank uh, Crystal Davis publicly. Uh, she's done a lot of work on campus organizing around racial justice. Um, I met her at the HRC uh, a number of months ago, but um, just as a connection between MSU's campus and East Lansing, I think this conversation happens on campus as well, and I, she's been a leader in that, so I want to thank her for, for doing that work. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Ms. Bartell. Thank you, Mayor. The next caller is phone number ending in 552. Hi, uh, this is Kath Etzel. Um, so I, I just wanted to make a point that um, it's interesting that in this situation, Officer Stevenson has done something that many of us feel was very questionable and we are being asked to look at the good things he has done in his life, the goodness he has been as an officer, and not focus on two pretty brutal takedowns and three other complaints by people of color. At the same point in time, when George Floyd is murdered, we bring up his past history of the bad things that he has done. And this is a very typical maneuver um, to to continue to justify the brutality and over-policing of black and brown bodies in our community and other communities as well. Um, and, and now to continue to allow police officers to, um, you know, well, you know, other than this, he's a really good guy. Um, so I find that incredibly problematic um, with individuals who are, you know, quote unquote, coming to his defense. Um, the second point I wanted to make was um, that uh, with um, the woman that talked about uh, the taxes, you know, I'm a taxpayer in this community as well. I've lived here almost 40 years um, and uh, I voted in favor of the income tax um, for the overall good of the community, whether it was broken out into individual budget items or not. Um, but not for specifically to continue to fund the police department as we've been funding it in the past um, and strongly support using those funds for uh, uh, much more, many of the things that police officers in this community are trying to do that they aren't trained to do and use individuals that are trained to do those things like social workers working in the cars. So those are my two comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bartell. Thank you, Mayor. The next caller on the list has joined uh, with their name. So it looks like it's Crystal Rose Davis. You may now address council. Oh, that was me again. I didn't realize that I can participate video. <laughs> but I, did, okay. I have an opportunity. I did want to follow up um, for Ron's question about uh, the police chief. Like, it, where where are we at with that? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Lahanas, where are we with that? Yes, so the position posting closed last week. Uh, we've done a first review of the applications and are setting interviews with the panel, a mixed panel of staff and community members for the week after uh, the 4th of July. And then hopefully the week after that with uh, myself, perhaps also a chance to meet with council 
and then we will go, be going to a decision shortly thereafter. Thank you. Uh, is the caller, uh, I, I don't see the caller anymore. Are you still on, Crystal? Oh. You, did have, you did have about a minute left for your original. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm still here. I think it, it some, for some, uh, well, for a few of us um, as residents of wanting um, the decision of the hiring of police chief to wait after the formation of the advisory committee and um, also that that committee as well has input on the hiring of that of the new chief. Um, and so um, either way, I mean, I will follow up um, as if right now that you guys don't necessarily have someone aligned. Yes, um, would you, yeah, I would appreciate an email about that. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bartel. Thank you, Mayor. The next caller on the list is joined under the title call in user one. Hi, my name is Kathy. Um, I've been listening to some of this and I've been kind of paying attention to what's been going on. But I do have one question. Is the gentleman that was arrested, does he have any onus in responsibility for any of this? Um, Kathy, is that a rhetorical question? No, I'm just, I just, it's not really rhetorical. It's there's responsibility that goes around. I, I mean, if, if they say get out of the car, get out of the car. Or do you not have to follow direction? Could he just stay in the car? And then if he didn't want to get out of the car and didn't want to do anything else, could he just drive away? I mean, what, what are the rules? I don't Again. think I know the rules. Okay. Again, if you'd like to make a statement, that's fine. If you have a serious question that, that requires an answer, I'd be happy to answer. Well, my serious question is, does, does the gentleman that was arrested, does he have any responsibility in anything that happened during that? Okay. So if you've asked that question twice, I will now answer. Yes. The person who was arrested should not have turned right without signaling, and he should not have been driving with a suspended license. Okay. But should he have gotten... I think the license was suspended, yeah. That's what I mean. um, should, should he have gotten out of the car when he was told to get out of the car? So here we're getting into a long debate about the history of police and African Ameri African Americans in this country, which I don't think we have time for. Um, no, that, but, but let's no, say, really. that, please don't interrupt me. I didn't interrupt you. I'm trying to answer your question. Um, that said... When a police officer asks you to get out of a car, you should get out of a car. But that does not mean that you should also be slammed to the ground, have your head bashed into the ground twice until your face is abraded, have a knee on your neck, be told to stop struggling when you are already handcuffed and not moving, continue to have the knee on your upper back or neck until at least 10 seconds after you stop struggling, then as you're pulled up, have a hood pulled over your head so nobody can see the abrasion. That's the problem. Well, it's not so, it's not so. Okay. Sorry, okay. I couldn't, I couldn't no, finish. I'm this sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. I'm finished. Go ahead. I, I just want to know, we have to follow directions too. I mean, we have to take all take responsibility when something like this goes down. There are, there are rules and regulations. I don't think it's fair to put all of the onus on the part of the police. I think everybody should take some responsibility for what happened. If it comes out that he did go too far, it may come out that this officer is actually innocent of what he's being accused of. Is that true? That obviously is true. Okay. That's, Here, that's kind of what I was looking for. And what about the charges with that gentleman? Did the charges get dropped? Did he have to pay a fine? Those charges were dropped. He did not have to pay a fine. He had to pay $257 to have his car taken out of impound. Okay. I, was just, I, I wasn't sure exactly what had been the bottom line in all of this. If he had done what he had, was supposed to do, would he have been arrested or you don't know? I fear is that if he had been white, he wouldn't have been pulled over in the first place. 
Oh, and you're saying the entire police department pull people over because of their color? Just tell you my fear. Oh, that's a terrible fear to have because I don't have that same fear. That's a terrible fear to have. I mean, I'm a liberal, I'm a progressive, but I think the way that everything is, is being painted is just wrong. We have to use our intelligence and we have to pick and choose between what's right and wrong. And we've all raised children to follow the rules. This was a grown man. He was my age. And if a cop told me to get out of a car, I'd get out of the car. I wouldn't be driving without a driver's license that was legal either. I'm not saying that it's remaining. Okay, I'm not saying if he, and I heard him on that tape. I watched the tape, and he said, come and get me. What, what did he think was going to happen? Did he want them to come and get him, or he didn't? I generally don't say things unless I mean them. What do you think? Thank you. Um, Council Member Stevens. Thanks. Um, so... I think that uh, we can have a further conversation on privilege if we want to, um, but you know, not recognizing the fact that, um, <laughs> I mean this so seriously, uh, if, if somebody who has um, called in has never turned out of a parking lot um, and they are white and they have not used a turn signal before, um, if they've been pulled over every time, great. Um, then you have every right to, to say what you're saying. Um, if you're in situations where you've committed traffic violations, you know, maybe even in front of a police car and, and not gotten pulled over, um, then you, know, you can't tell whether that situation was just based on um, the fact that they didn't want to pull you over, they thought it was you know, a, um, a non-issue, or if it was based in bias. Um, that's, that's the point. Um, and and that's the point of discussion. And I, I'm going to I'm going to finish really quick here and just and just say that, you know, if somebody is told to do something and the, the man repeatedly said, give me a ticket, give me a ticket, please give me a ticket. I'm going home. Give me a ticket. That man had indicated that he was willing to pay the fine, get the thing sorted out, whatever it was. And then he was told um, that he was going to be under arrest instead of that. I just we're in a situation where I think we have a fundamental difference on what public safety means. And truthfully, if somebody isn't a danger to themselves or somebody else, I, I don't see a reason why that man should have been arrested in the first place. So um, that's my, well, that's that my thought. On it, I will. Um, Ms. Bartell, Ms. Bartell, this caller's five minutes is up. I think you're muted. Nicole. Sorry about that. Thank you. That was the end of the caller list for this evening. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is a natural breaking time. Um, I'm, I'm let's break until it's eight 38. Can we break until eight 48 before we get back to this? So I will see you then. Um, Nicole, will you put on the be, ba be right back screen? Absolutely. All right. Eight 48.
Hey, Nicole, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great, thank you. It's right here, Terry. It's right there. Okay, we are back. Um, the next item on the agenda is uh, more communications from the mayor and council members. I will start today with council member Greg. Um, okay, let me gather my thoughts for a second. Um, so I think just kind of addressing the tone of some of the calls that we just had. I wanted to, I have very publicly put myself forward as the council member who is probably at least the most vocal about dramatic police reform. I don't have a true feeling for how the other council members feel about it. Um, but I wanted to kind of um, address the idea of where some of those thoughts are coming from. So I am, I am, you know, part of the national conversation. I'm uh, reading resources that are posted in articles and stuff like that. But I'm also talking to local people who I feel to be experts. Um, I've chatted with the Lansing police chief. Um, I feel a little, just because of the way our city council is structured, we are at the top of the pyramid and then, um, uh, George Lohannes is our city manager. He's under us. And I feel a little, I feel like it puts our city employees in an uncomfortable position to have their boss's boss come to them. Um, and so I've been a little tentative about reaching out to our police officers, although I certainly am interested in what they have to say. Um, and we'll work on trying to figure out the most comfortable way for them in that situation, not for me. Um, I've also been speaking with professors from the criminology department at MSU. And I had a long conversation in George's office with him and our acting police chief, Steve Gonzalez last week about what the first steps in some of those reforms might be. So I know that I have been um, probably one of the reasons that morale is not great in our police department right now. Um, because to have you know somebody who's the head of your city talking about defunding your department publicly is probably not a great feeling, um, and I don't, I don't know how to frame the con that that conversation to be both true to the spirit of police reform in the form that I think that needs to take, which is dramatic, and also recognize that our officers are working hard at a difficult job, which I absolutely do. Um, every officer that I've had the pleasure to meet personally, I have has, you know, struck me as a professional and competent person. Um, I'm not, I'm not putting myself in opposition to any specific officer, um, more to the structure that informs their job. So I think one of the things that we, and I talked to, about this a little bit in my comments a couple of weeks ago, one of the things that we are asking of our police officers is that they be engaged community members, somehow going out and forging these personal connections with our people also ready to spring into action at a moment's notice when there's some sort of violent crime. But functionally speaking, they're spending a lot of their time responding to very minor calls that barely qualify as crime. So one of the things that I talked about with George and our acting to, um, police chief Steve, who's not here tonight, um, but I understand that um, Chad Connolly is on the line, um, is just taking a, a look at what our officers are responding to. What are the call logs that are taking up their time every day. Um, and really my goal in doing that is not to prove that they're not earning their um, worth because I think that they are. It's really to prove that their training is not being properly directed, that they are trained in violent response 
criminal apprehension, serious matters of public safety. And we are asking them to check on barking dogs and locked cars. And um, I think Ruth will talk to about this in a little bit about um, disputes in parks. So I do not think that that is fair to our officers. I think that some of that time should be given back to them so that we can embed training throughout the year so that they don't have to um, do all of their training in one week so that they can use, they have time in their regular shifts to, um, to do the types of training that we're asking of them to practice the skills that we're asking them in de-escalation and um, some of the other things that we think. And that some of those calls need to be, some of them, perhaps a lot of them, I don't know, we have only taken the first step in this process, but some of those need to be um, allocated to agencies that are more appropriate. So I talked to, um, I talked a little bit in response to one of our callers earlier about the task force that is hopefully being formed. I don't know, I'm not watching that meeting. I'm imagining that they voted through um, the formation of that task force, but I think that's a really positive first step. I think that we have um, regional problems um, of homelessness. We have regional problems of uh, limited capacity for mental health um, help for people who need it. Um, one of the things I, I spoke about in my comments was my wish to um, defund the jail portion of our police department. Um, so one of those time allocation questions that I'd like to put more um, thought into is what types of criminals we are holding in those cells. Are they truly violent disturbers of the peace or are they just intoxicated beyond a level of personal safety? Um, I suspect that there is at least a significant portion of the latter. So I think, you know, some type of secure sobering facility that could be even a county level facility. Um, I think these are conversations that we need to have. I think we need to have a really open mind about what those reforms could look like. Um, they could look like a traditional police department, but there is a very good chance that they might not. Um, and I am hoping that I have good partners on this council. I'm hoping that I have a good partner in our city attorney and in our city manager. Um, I'm disheartened that the day after I had a very long talk with um, Mr. Lajanis and Steve Gonzalez that our police department was dispatched to um, take care of a very minor interaction in the park, which um, I think Ruth will speak to, but for at least some of the people involved in that conversation, it was not casual when you're a young person, a young man of color, and you see a police officer walking towards you when you know that you've done nothing wrong. That is a very serious thing for that person to experience. Um, so I think we owe it to our officers and we owe it to our residents to stop using our police in that way. Um, anyway, so <laughs> just to continue that conversation, mostly I just wanted to assure people that I'm not I'm not reacting to some, um, you know, public pressure to defund the police. I'm really trying to engage the right people in this discussion, and it is the very first step in a very long discussion. So, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Councilmember Meadows, then Councilmember Babcock, and then Count, then Mayor Pro Tem Stevens. Councilmember Meadows. Hey, um, I didn't know I was going to be called next. Well, you're you're either going to be called next or after me, that or uh, after that. So, <laughs> okay, I'll I'll do it. Um, uh, I want to just uh, mention first the appointment of Elaine Hardy, uh, an old friend of mine, somebody who's worked here as long as I've been around, uh, who's done an incredible job, and I I don't think that the community is quite aware of how dedicated she has been to this community, but also how dedicated she's been to racial equity and the things that can be done throughout this region. Uh, you know, there's, no, there's a reason that um, Elaine was the president of the MLK Commission. She is uh, a force of nature in terms of organizing and doing the right thing and making sure that uh, we will, as a city, be approaching these issues in the right way. So. Uh, I think it's a great appointment. Congratulations, Elaine. Uh, she's an absolutely wonderful person and I think she'll do a great job for the city. Um, I, I wanna also mention the number of people who called in. We had about an hour and a half of uh, call-ins uh, today. So I think about, I think a week ago or 
at some point, uh, the mayor pro tem mentioned that he's, he was hoping that we would continue to offer this uh, type of involvement uh, even after we can no longer use it ourselves. And uh, I wanna really second that completely. I think that this proves that there, if it's just like, if, if you can mail in your vote, that it's a lot easier to vote. It's a lot easier to communicate with and participate in these meetings. If you can do it from the comfort of your home and still, th and still know that you're gonna get your voice heard and your questions answered. So I'm, I'm very much in support of that. The, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about something I think we've gotten away with, I mean, away from, um, you know, MSU in terms of its training police officers, I think was one of the original uh, authors of sort of the community policing type of approach to policing within uh, any city or village or township or wherever. And we embraced it uh, for a long period of time. I think we've gotten away from that a little bit. And I think that does answer some of the things that Jesse was talking about. I think we need to re-examine uh, whether in terms of this long range view of the police department and determining what, what is right, what's wrong and how we can restructure that, that uh, we need to emphasize again, community policing because that uh, at one time was, you know, there was somebody assigned to a neighborhood a police officer, plus a, a building inspector, plus fire personnel, plus anybody who could help within the community. And that's, that's your, an issue that was, uh, you know, trained in a different uh, profession uh, that might be more appropriate for what is happening there. So I, I think that's part of our, our uh, what we need to take a look at. And then again to Jesse, you know, Charter Provision 4.9, just in case you're nervous about it, uh, specifically provides the council or any council member may request information of any employee or officer of the city regarding the conduct of any department, office, or officers of the city. So you have a perfect right to ask anybody for information with regard to how it's being operated and what could be done. If you want to do your own sort of investigation as to what's happened or talk to any police officer or any other employee of the city, you have a right to do so. And that was added, I might add, to the uh, charter back in 1997 or 1998 when we last took a, a real look at, at uh, changing the charter in some way. And then um, I, I think that, uh, I, I think I agree that we're going to totally look at the operation of the police department and how it is how it functions and operates within our community. I think that's important to do. Uh, that it's important to do even with regard to the jail because there are issues involving the jail. We we do hold, you know, drunks there. We also use it as a holding area uh, for overnight stays because we are required once we find a a drunk, I think Tom can weigh in on this, but I think once somebody's drunk, we have to keep them there until they are sober before we can let them go, especially if they're underage. And the other option is to send people to the county jail, which means that people could be released from the county jail and be miles and miles away from their home. We deal with a university campus and it's important for us to have services that are convenient to it because it has a population that is not all that mobile. That's why we have a court here. That's why we have a jail here. And that's primarily what it's used for. I think that we do have to examine and get some report on the exact use of that jail. I think that would be very uh, useful for us. And so that's kind of more long-winded than I usually am, but I'm done, so. Thank you, Mr. Meadows. Uh, Council Member Babcock. Thank you. With all of the talk about policing, which is important and relevant, um, I'd like to remind folks that this Friday, June 26th, is the deadline to apply to be on what we're calling the study committee, uh, which will create the committee that reviews police complaints. Um, I know it, how very governmental to create a committee that creates a committee, but I'd really like to emphasize the importance of 
the committee to create a committee or what we call the study committee because it's going to set up a process that we're going to use for a very long time. Uh, one question I have had is whether you can apply for the study committee and then the committee that will actually review complaints against the police. And my understanding is yes, um, I, I don't hear any objections to that. So if you're thinking that you have to make a choice between one or the other, that is not the case. Uh, the application and background material are on the city website. You do not have to be a city resident. Um, if you have relevant experience that you'd like to share and you want to participate, please volunteer. Um, other than that, I'd like to congratulate Ms. Hardy. Um, where I come from, force of nature is not just a compliment, but the ultimate compliment. And I don't think it quite does Ms. Hardy justice. So congratulations to her and um, congratulations to all of us for having her in that role. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Stevens. Thank you, Mayor Beyer. Um, I have some written comments and some things off the cuff I wanna say. Um, so if I am less than eloquent in the beginning, I do apologize. So um, I wanna to talk to or speak to uh, Council Member Greg's comments earlier um, and kind of just really outline and solidify where I am. So, um, and I, I reached out to a, a, a good mentor of mine, um, Sarah Anthony, um, because I was struggling last week um, with, with how to approach this issue in, in the correct way and be cognizant of folks and, and really, you know, push for the right things and the right agenda. And um, as some of you know, I've been um, interested in, in working towards police and public safety oversight in general for the better part of my term. Um, I've done this work for a number of reasons, but um, I'll get into a couple of things a little bit later. So many people of color, including myself, um, before all this movement, um, when we've worked on this issue in the past, we do something called code switching. Um, for those of you who don't know what that means, it basically means I'm very cognizant of the fact that when a person of color is talking about reform on police, it may view or it may be viewed as coming from a place of personal feeling rather than really what's pushing for the best of the community. Um, and I, I fall myself into that category very often um, when I'm speaking because I end up speaking in passive tone um, because I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable with that fact. And of course, that's not um, the responsibility of those people of color, but um, I think many of us end up doing that anyway. Um, so I wanna be really clear right now. Um, I am very committed to radical change and that includes having the conversation of defunding the police as that policy has been intended. Um, and I'll say that right now. Um, I also wanna just mention as a side note, the sobering center I think is a great idea. I think it's a regional approach. That's something that's really, really good. I would love to see that. Um, so I'm gonna comment on a couple of things that happened in the past week or so. So we had two major failures in East Lansing in this past week, to my mind. Um, we had the police called on a pickleball court dispute, dispute and we had a failure of personal responsibility, a responsibility of a business and the city to prevent the spread of a virus. Um, let's address one after the other. So I've said this before and I will again, I cannot comprehend why we are sending police to situations um, like the one we did. Um, we now have an avenue for people to be available at those facilities and that's great. But my question is, is our, is our city leadership really recognizing the issue with this? Um, and I mean this seriously, because when we talk about radical change, I need to know the folks that I am working with are on board and thinking about things differently. Because if the reaction, if the first reaction to a simple dispute is a, is a police officer, I, I, I don't know if, if we are on the same page. By all accounts that I read, by the way, um, and I was not there, I haven't seen any of the footage, um, the officer handled the situation amicably, but I don't think it should be an officer's job to handle this. I cannot explain how much privilege it is for a white person to know that they can call the police and have no fear and they have every ounce of faith that the situation will be resolved through them. That's just not the situation for many people, um, men, many people in our community. Um, you know, I literally walked around the Pinecrest neighborhood Mar on a March for Juneteenth with a sign that said, don't call the police on black people for walking their dog as a cry to an earlier situation that I was told happened there. And then a day later, the police were called to handle a, a dispute about a pickleball court. Um, no but less. I, I don't mean to interrupt you, um, Mr. Stevens, but I just want to let you know that that wasn't the administration. That was me 
and the it, it's it's a little bit more nuanced story which i'll get into i just don't want i just don't want you to blame the administration the administration is definitely on your side and wants to do less policing this was my error which i will talk about okay that's okay um then i'll i will save my next sentence for maybe a reaction to some of your comments on that um but you know <laughs> what i really want us to be looking at um, and every call made to the department and analyze, is this something that an officer should be responding to? I mean, this was as simple as somebody having a reservation. And I will direct this not in relation to the situation that happened on Saturday, but I'll direct this at George um, directly as the leader of the city. You know, what do you believe is needed for radical public safety reform? Um, what is your vision for public safety? Because at the end of the day, you know, each member of council, myself included, are attempting and have been attempting to find small solutions to specific problems that are a much bigger issue. And the truth is, the people that know the most about the city and how it run are the people in charge. And we need someone who's going to actively pursue that change and bring us options in the future for ways that we can handle situations better. Um, so I want to know what that vision is. Um, council gets the final call, but we need a partner in that office pushing this agenda too. And, you know, what I, what I haven't asked before and what I should have asked in the beginning of this conversation is that, you know, the city manager is a partner to the city council. Yes, we do employ the city manager, but they run the city on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I find myself being responsive to situations rather than being proactive about situations because we address issues when they come up. And so what I really want to know is what is the vision of the city manager for policing when we talk about defunding the police? And on top of that, are you committed to finding a police chief that's willing to have that conversation about reimagining public safety with the council? Um, so I'll leave that to the city manager and then I have some other comments after that. So you'd like a response now, I'm taking it. If, if, you, if you need some time to think about it, that is a big yeah. question. Well, no, I'll just, I'll give a quick response. So obviously I understand the need to do significant changes to how we police. We've heard that from council over and over again very clearly. So council has set up a couple of processes here where there's gonna be, I think, significant feedback. One is gonna be this, the community review that we've talked about where the application starts this, ends this Friday, where the police chief myself will be active participants, active listeners in hearing what this group is gonna suggest in terms of reforms and different ways of doing policing. We've also set out a process where council wants to have a retreat to talk about equity in terms of overall city policies, but in terms of the city itself, um, how we're policing, but also, like I said, the overall administration of the city. So in terms of, of um, policing, if you want to hear specifically from me what my suggestions are, I would be happy to write out a plan for you. I was not going to do that because I thought that, that the council wants to take the lead on this process and also have the community to uh, provide input on that, but I would be more than happy to lay out what I think a reasonable uh, array of decisions would be in terms of staffing, in terms of um, response, in terms of training, in terms of oversight, in terms of any of those areas. Um, there's been lots of discussion interior to the city about this, and I would be happy to lay that out for council if you'd like to see that. If you think it's redundant or if that's taken away from the discussion in the public, I can wait until after the public has weighed in, but that's certainly for council to ask. Um, in terms of defunding the police, I haven't heard strong direction or clear direction from council that you want to see a plan on what a defunded department looks like. So I haven't heard that yet, but I'm certainly willing to provide a plan on wide scale police reform and working with the department to make it um, a place where everyone, like the mayor has said, everyone feels welcome in East Lansing. And I think that's something certainly I could do. So I would, I would love to see your suggestions as well. Obviously council does get the final say, but, but I think, you know, especially when we're talking about a city manager form of government and, and I think individual council members, um, you know, pushing ideas and different things. And by the way, a lot of really great ideas too. Um, I, you know, I want to know that our city leadership is, is on that same page too. Um, and so I would love to see those ideas moving forward and I'd love to see a commitment from that. Um, and if the mayor will allow, I have, I have some other comments on other related. So, and I, and I just want to point out, you know, uh, you know, and this is to my next point, we had a police officer respond to this, um, but we couldn't have unarmed officers telling folks, you know, to socially distance or, 
handing out masks while they are downtown. I mean, that's public safety, you know, that is literally public safety. Um, and so I'll, I'll address the, the um, situation at uh, a bar over here in East Lansing as, as brief as I can. So situation where 14 people tested positive for COVID-19 as a direct result of a bar being open in East Lansing, having people without masks in close quarters. Um, we were told by Ingham County Health Department that we also need business owners to take responsibility. That's fine. I wanna know how we make them. Um, I wanna see a plan from our staff on how we ensure people are socially distancing and wearing masks. I'm pretty sure we can tell people to wear masks um, and I wanna be doing that. And if we need to buy you know, one use masks to assure that or tell people to go home and get a mask to come back, I'm, I'm happy to do that. You know, I, I don't want altercations, but I also think that when we're having this conversation about like demilitarizing and stuff, when I said unarmed officers telling folks to socially distance or handing out masks, I mean that. I mean, like we're, we're talking about a situation in which, you know, there's no necessarily crime being committed, but, but we can tell folks to have masks. And so I want us to be doing that. Um, and I want to know if businesses are denying folks from coming in for not wearing a mask. And if they aren't, I want to know why. Um, and if we don't have a method for requiring responsibility, I want to have a method to shut them down if they don't take it upon themselves. I don't want another situation where we're scrambling to take action on a weekend and we're emailing back and forth and trying to figure it out. We have a couple of months until school comes back in session. And I imagine a lot of these laws and rules will still be in place because of the spread of this disease. And I want to be able to say, you know what, it's gotten out of control. We're shutting it down. Um, because because we need to be able to do that, not in three days, but when we need to shut it down. Um, so I want to have that knowledge laid out so we can take action. Um, and I've been fairly silent about this, but I mean, I really want to see um, our university communicate with us a little bit more. I will probably be talking about this to some university administration um, during a quarterly meeting. But I mean, reopening, and I I don't know if other members of council did, but I got almost no communication previously on that decision-making process or the, you know, um, the group that they were committed. I don't, George, I'm looking to you. Were any city officials or anybody on that, that task force that they committed to, to reopening? Uh, no. So I understand that there's a, it's a pretty broad subcommittee structure. And I believe that Elaine Hardy is one of the people that they asked to serve. So um, uh, as far as, uh, I'm not exactly clear how many employees they have on their their committee structure overall, though. Yeah, I just I would have hoped that we had learned from the university shutting down and everybody flooding to the bars the first time, because, you know, what's going to happen is we're going to have to deal with a lot of issues because of it. Um, and I'm tired and I'm tired of people not understanding that we are in this together and I'm tired of being responsive rather than being proactive. This is the most pivotal time in East Lansing history. We have a lot of things going on and I think we need to be working together on this. So I'm gonna be talking about that then, but you know, I welcome any extra communication that we can have with the university because it's, it's not just about messaging at this point. It's about really big decisions being made and us not being part of the conversation. So that's my last comment um, and uh, I will end it there. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Um, I had two issues and now, thanks to you, Mr. Stevens, I have three issues. Um, the first one is um, to follow up on what you were saying. I agree uh, that I would love to hear from Mr. Lahannis specifically if you, I would like you to use the data that um, Council Member Greg has asked for on how many calls would not really need an armed officer. And how many call, that's like, that's one subset of data. Then how many calls would need somebody with skills other than a typical police officer? So social work skills, arbitration skills, I don't know. And if, if that is say 50% of the work, then I would like to see a proposal to not downsize the department, but have fewer armed officers and maybe retrain some of our officers to do some of those other things that are more appropriate. For example, like we recently did because of my error with the with the uh, somebody to um, work for the park work in the parks when there's a dispute. So that I would like to look at have that included in your um, in, in when you're crafting your proposal. It might not be your proposal, but just keep it in mind. Is is that clear, Mr. Wells? Yeah. So uh, when does council want this information by? 
Uh, I'm not in a, in a hurry. This is going to take a long time. Um, just it's, it is yeah. one of the key things we're working on, but it's not, we don't need it by next Monday or anything. Right, Mr. Stevens? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, and then my my first issue that I wanted to talk about is uh, also related to COVID and, and Harper's, and I have a, a little bit of a different uh, perspective on this by now than uh, Mr. Stevens. So over the last two weeks, we have gotten a lot of questions about COVID in the city, what we can do, and Harper's in particular. Every day, I get a picture of of the line at Harper's. Um, later on, I'm going to ask the city attorney to talk about what we can do and what we can't do. Um, but essentially, in terms of stopping a lot of this behavior, the Constitution lets people make stupid decisions, even if they end up making those people sick and me dead. Unfortunately, that's the way that is. And we found that out in March, Mr. Stevens. We could have been pro as proactive as we wanted. We do not have the authority to close down businesses. Now, maybe Mr. Yaden and Mr. Lahannis can work together to figure out how we can get around that. Um, Mr. Lahannis made a first attempt today and wrote to the county health department and the county health department basically wrote back and said, yeah, that's not your job. That's our job. And right now we're not doing it. Effectively, that's what, that, that's what was told to us. So I'm just as angry as you are, but Unfortunately, the way the, the structure works in Michigan, the, the city that actually houses the businesses that are doing the things that are killing the city's residents has no power. So that's that's my general. Uh, yes, Mr. Stevens. Mayor Beyer, um, just as a, as a tiny question, um, an interjection, I apologize, but okay. um, people are required to have masks indoors as well as um, Outdoors, socially distanced, sure, but indoors in an establishment, they're required to have masks. Is that correct? I think it is. And I am going to ask Mr. Yaden to talk about that particular issue, okay. on whether we can ask people at close down businesses because of that. So be prepared, yeah, Mr. Yaden. Thank you. That's a warning. <laughs> in case I forget to ask, I need you to talk about that. Thanks, Mr. Stevens. All right. So as I said, we went through this in March. We worked really hard. We tried to do something to keep the COVID caseload from spiking. I know every council member was working on that. Um, and over and over daily, we were told, yeah, not your job. Finally, fortunately, big Gretch stepped in, closed everything down, and the kids had to go back home and could not continue to gather. At that time, I talked to Harper's. I talked to the RIV. I talked to, I think those are the only two owners I talked to. And I asked them, I said, will you please close? And they said, no, I will not. So that's, that was the extent of our power. And I wanna emphasize that we are in exactly the same position now. We can't prevent bars from staying open unless somebody can come up with a, an idea that we, couldn't, we, thought of, we hadn't thought of before. So lines outside of Harper have, Harper's have been the topic that has been giving me the most emails, but. I really don't understand that. The science shows that COVID-19 spreads easily inside. It spreads outside, but it's much harder. You have to be right up in somebody's face when they're coughing at you. You, can you cannot get it when you're running behind somebody and they're breathing out COVID just because of the way air works. Now, if you're standing right next to somebody in a line and you're all over them, like some of these students are, you may well get it. But almost certainly, if it is coming from Harper's, it came from inside Harper's which nobody's writing to me about because nobody who writes to me will go into Harper's, I'm sure. So masks are important outside, but they're even more important inside because that's probably where the contagion is occurring. So given all that, here's my question. What can we do to make it possible for us to reopen safely, for MSU to reopen safely? So. This is a trick question. It's impossible to reopen safely. And that's another thing everybody seems to be forgetting. The entire country, including our governor, has decided to reopen even though it's not safe. So just think about that for a minute. It's just not safe to reopen. We are in the midst of a pandemic. We're not at the end. The virus is not getting weaker. If anything, it's getting stronger. 
It's mutating and getting stronger. It well could be the virus that wipes out a huge portion of the world's population. This is not anything that we're getting any close to getting better, that is getting better. The president can't make it safe for things to open. The governor cannot make it safe for things to open. The mayor of East Lansing can't make it safe for things to open. The city manager can't make it safe. It's simply not safe to open. So all of this anger about people being in line and making it unsafe and being close together in a bar and making it unsafe. The fact that those businesses are open, period, no matter how people behave, you can't eat with a mask on. If you're inside of a room talking, talking loudly, which people do in bars, you're going to expel the same kind of air they did in the, in the choir practice where 80% of the people got sick. What's happened in this country and the state, and it sounds like the city, is that public opinion has shifted from shifted from protecting people's personal health to protecting their economic health. That's what the president's done. That's what the governor has finally started to do. I, when I say finally, I don't mean like it's a good thing, but she held out longer than every other governor, but finally has said, all right, we're gonna have to let people die now. Now she won't say those words, but when you reopen a school or you reopen a bar, that's what you do. People are going to be able to get paid because they're working, but everybody, including them, also has a better chance of dying. The only way to be safe when things reopen is to not go to those places. Don't go to a building with people in it. Don't stand in a line with people in it. Don't have anything to do with people who have stood in a line or gone into a building with people in it. Now, there are agents who could do a lot to help keep us safe. MSU could choose not to reopen. And Mr. Stevens, with all respect, I don't think if we had been involved in those meetings and we said, don't reopen, they would have listened to us. There's, it, we're, we're, a, we're a blip on their, on their radar, but not a very big one. Bars and restaurants could go back to takeout only. And when I say that, I know that I, am, I will cause some bars and restaurants to actually close, which I don't wanna do, but it doesn't matter because they won't listen to me anyway. Young people could choose to stay out of lines and social distance. But, but we can't compel them to do that. That said, we have done some things to mitigate the danger, and I'm not saying to make it safe. Um, we are in regular communication with the bars and restaurants and recently have hooked up the bars and restaurants with Michigan State University to talk about how to mitigate the danger, which again, I think is impossible. The city manager has again appealed to the Ingham County Health Department to see what we can do about lines and crowds. We were again told that's not your job. We did close part of Albert, Albert Avenue expressly to improve safety, to encourage people to get their food and sit outside. Same people, same socialization, but not in a closed building where the air can't circulate. Uh, the DDA stepped up and provided direct grants to businesses to help them stay afloat when they couldn't be open because it wasn't safe. We have chosen not to reopen HANA because that puts people inside where COVID is. Um, we have chosen not to open the outdoor pool, even though that is outdoors, it was a very crowded area and we didn't think that was safe. Our operations are still streamlined. We still have people working in shifts so that we don't spread COVID among our own staff. And the last I heard, Mr. Lahanis, nod your head wrong if I'm wrong, we did not have one case of COVID yet. So we are doing well with that. Correct. Okay, and, and against my advice, the city did decide to open the farmer's market partly because it was outside and we were able to spread it out. And we have encouraged people to wear masks. But if we have a spike from the, from the farmer's market, I will ask again, that we close it and people get their vegetables from the same farmers in a different way. So I'll call on you a second, Mr. Stevens. Even though I made an error on the wrong side of this equation this weekend, which I will discuss in a second, the city is making a conscious effort also just to police less and trying to get inebriated young people to follow a state level, a state executive order would almost certainly end up in an arrest. So when you ask and they say, no, what do you do? When you tell and they say, no, what do you do? There has to be some enforcement or nothing will happen. Um, I agree with when I talked about this with the city manager that putting hands on young people to try to get them to wear masks in a line is a recipe for disaster that we should avoid. 
even if we could legally enforce the executive order, that's not what police are for. And if you have somebody that's less than police who has no authority, it just won't work. So before I go on to my next um, issue, Mr. Stevens, would, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, um, just if if we can require masks at the farmer's market somehow, I just, I want us to do it. If I, I don't want to wait until we have a case to, to, to do that. Um, and could you could you also weigh in on that? Would we be allowed to, because it's our market, uh, require all patrons to wear masks? Um, you, you could wait until we talk about all these issues if you don't mind. Yeah. Okay, okay. Mr. Stevens, I'll get that. So finally, to protect yourselves, uh, stay home or stay within your very small bubble. If you want to expand your bubble, do so after everybody else gets tested. Um, to young people who want to drink and socialize at Harper's, I understand. I was there once. Uh, I, let, I stayed there longer than average, actually, but I would like to think that if I, that in this situation, if I were in this and I were 25 years old, I would choose to protect myself and I would choose to protect my friends and especially the people in my community who might die because I wanted to drink and socialize. I think that would even have gotten into my 25-year-old head, but you never know. Okay, so the second issue is... is, is even more painful than the first one. So this relates to um, a very distressing incident that occurred on Saturday night at Patriarch Park. I, I worked on this statement for a long time and I actually wrote it down, so I'm just going to read it. I'm bringing this up because it caused pain that could have been avoided and I hope in the future will be avoided. This is what happened. The Greater Lansing Pickleball Association began arriving at the park shortly before 10 o'clock, and that's sorry, that's Patriarch Park, as they have been for years. When they arrived, some of the pickleball courts were occupied by an organized group of young people playing a soccer tennis tournament, which is a game where you kick the uh, soccer ball over the net. The pickleball players believed that they, the Greater Lansing Pickleball Association had reserved the courts since that had been the custom in previous years. Soccer tennis players informed the pickleball players that they had checked on the city website and could not find any information about reservations being allowed. The pickleball players eventually came to realize that they did not in fact have a reservation. And in the end, the two groups figured out a way to share the courts. Unfortunately, quite a bit of damage occurred on the way to that resolution, which is what I am talking about today. So before things were resolved, the soccer tennis players were subject to aggressive statements from some of the pickleball players. In addition, on at least one occasion, a pickleball player approached the organizer of the soccer tennis group and told him that these co these courts are our excuse me these are our courts. You have to leave. Perhaps the most damaging exchange ended when the pickleball player said to the soccer tennis organizer, who is an Asian American, "Well, I pay more property taxes than you do." This statement is, on its face, racist even if it is unconsciously so. It was certainly classless, classist, and it was deeply insulting and hurtful to the Asian American. The Asian American's parents moved to East Lansing with very little and have worked all their lives to create a better life for their children. Directly attacking his perceived level of wealth was offensive and traumatic to him. It also made him feel belittled and unwelcome. We can and we must do better than this. I also need to discuss my part in this. Sometime in the middle of the tensions, one of the pickleball players called me and told me that people were playing soccer on the tennis courts. In hindsight, I wish I had said, this problem does not rise to a call to the mayor on a Saturday morning, please figure it out for yourself. Instead, I responded as I usually do when a resident calls. I tried to fix it and I called the city manager. It was a strange situation because the city manager and I could not envision a game of soccer on a pickleball court. I assumed it was a bunch of kids playing soccer and using the pickleball nets as soccer nets, which would eventually ruin the nets. I also assumed that the pickleball players did have a reservation since they have had reservations Saturday mornings for the past five years. If I had known that the people were playing a different game than involved sending the ball over the net, I probably would have reminded the pickleball player that it was not long ago that pickleball players appropriated courts from tennis players and that they should just share the courts with the soccer tennis people. But my call to the city manager eventually led to a police officer being sent to Patriarch. We really 
and we really didn't have anyone else to send. We do now, which the city manager will talk about um, in his comments. After checking with the parks and recs direct director and discovering that in fact there were no reservations because of the COVID epidemic allowed, the city manager told the officer to simply check to make sure that the situation was being resolved by the parties and that no enforcement was needed or expected. By all accounts, the officer was courteous, gave the impression that he did not even think this was a matter for law enforcement and removed himself from the situation. So Ms. Gregg, I, I misunderstood that, um, but the police officer himself at least knows that's really not the job for a police officer. But when a police officer approaches any situation, it heightens tensions and can and, can, and did, did cause fear. I apologize for my part in this. As I said in his comments, Mr. Lahanis will discuss a solution that will prevent this use of police in the future. I want to close by saying, I know that every council member wants East Lansing to be a place where everyone feels welcome and protected, the city manager as well. We and all the residents of this wonderful community need to reflect on how we intentionally or unintentionally violate that ideal. I know I can do better, we all can do better, and I'm confident that we will. So I hope that explains what happened. Um, I, I, it, it's easy to talk about in shorthand, but it, it was a little nuanced. Uh, I spoke to the young man involved for a long time. He is, um, he is reassured and, and optimistic because of my statement and because of the way that the police officer acted. And um, we did make a very positive change as a result of it. Uh, Mr. Stevens. Thanks. Um, I appreciate your comments, Mayor Byer. Um, so I wanna I wanna state just kind of a thing, and this is more for the city manager, and this can be part of um, maybe suggestions in the future. But I, I want us to really, really think about every publicly used department that we have in the city, and if this situation could ever happen with anything else. If we have signs posted and, and people ready for the parks department, that's fine, but I don't want a parking situation, for instance, a, a situation in which one of our lots is, you know, somebody has a dispute there and uh, about a ticket, you know, or about one of their, their stubs getting into the parking structure and it's responded to by a police officer. I just want to make sure that everything we're using publicly, we don't ever have that excuse if there was nobody else to send. Um, you know, and there are situations where you have to send police, and I think you know, and I made this in my comments by every account that I've read. And again, I was not there. The officer handled the situation amicably. And, um, and, and this is news to me that the officer as well said, this probably does not rise to a, a law enforcement standard. Um, and I, I would assume that most officers in, in many situations like that have that exact same thought. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Stevens. Uh, the way it was explained to me from the young man I was speaking to is he said, I can tell by the look on his face. Gotcha. That he gotcha. didn't think that this was a reasonable place. For I, either way, I, I think that many people that are called for things that that they shouldn't be called for probably know that they should not be there. So I want us to really evaluate um, what other departments, what other areas could we potentially have a reservation issue, a parking issue, a DPW issue, and are we responding with an officer or are we responding with somebody with the necessary knowledge to just answer a question? Um, so. That's, that's just a side note for in the future. And, and I just wanna add a little bit onto that, Mr. Stevens. We do live in an unusual environment because we do have the police go when there's a loud party. We do have the police go when there's litter because I actually Pace can give a littering ticket, but if, there's a, if there are a bunch of kids outside throwing things around and making a mess, we send the police because they are inebriated. And if you send it, and they're really, I don't think that that's the place for anybody else than the police, but I guess I might be able to be talked out of that. But yeah, in a, no. college town, a college town is a little different than just a, a upper class town somewhere having a dispute in the park. Because no, I, I, I understand that completely. And I, and actually that speaks to the, the bigger conversation, which is, you know, our conversation, which is happening probably over the next few months about when we have police respond to things overall and not, but what I'm specifically saying is when it comes to city facilities, when it comes to things that we know we operate, I don't I don't wanna ever have a situation in which we say, 
we don't have anybody else to send, right? Because they're gotcha. our facilities, right? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. You know, uh, Mr. and yep. that's another conversation about police sending for unnecessary things in general. Okay, thank something. you. Mr. Meadows, you had your hand up. Yep. I, uh, I just want to, uh, when, when Tom weighs in on this or George, you know, I did meet with bar owners also, and uh, I think I've told the mayor that I was told, well, we can't really require somebody to wear a, a mask when they come into our establishment. That is not the order of the governor. The governor's order specifically says that upon entry to any enclosed public space, you must be wearing a mask. And uh, you are permitted to remove it when you're eating or drinking at a bar or restaurant, but you can't, you can be told you can't enter this establishment without a mask on. I think that same rule applies to any public facility. You know, I, I, I'm hesitant to, to stop any resident of this city from entering into city hall or any other uh, public building that uh, they need to enter into. But I think that we need to, we need to enforce that requirement ourselves. But I also want to know how we enforce bar owners who uh, and, and force them to require a mask before you can come in. My comment to the bar owners was, if you can put up a sign that says, no shoes, no shirt, no service, you can certainly put up a sign that says, no mask, no service. And I think that we need to enforce that very strongly. I just don't know exactly how to do it. I don't wanna have a bunch of police wandering around to enforce the mask requirement. But I think that we should have some way of um, issuing a violation or something when we see it occurring in any of our barn restaurants. So that's my two cents on it. Thank you. Council Member Gray. Um, I have some more comments on this subject, but we are going to hear from our city attorney about some of this. Yes. Yep, so I think right. I will yep. save my, um, I think I'll save my comments until then, as long as I will have another chance to say them. Of course. Awesome. Okay. So let's go on to the city manager's comments, uh, report, and then Mr. Yaden, if you will chime in with your, the comments that we asked you to talk about. Mr. Lahanas. So I'll just start off quickly with, uh, first, I want to mention, like everyone else mentioned, that I'm very pleased to have Elaine Hardy serving as our first diversity, equity, and inclusion administrator. I have worked with Elaine Hardy uh, probably for over 20 years at the City of East Lansing at this point, and uh, obviously I found her to be a, a great and dedicated employee to the city. She has also done a great job, obviously, in, in uh, leading the Michigan, I mean, the Martin Luther King Celebration Committee, I think is chair for the past 12 years. So she's done a lot of great service for this community and for the greater Lansing community as well. So very pleased that she's willing to step up into this role. I look forward to working with her on, on um, improving our equity throughout the city and looking forward to good things from her. So with that, I will jump over to the next thing, which was uh, the mayor's questions. So after talking to the Parks and Rec Director, we came up with what we believe is a solution for Patriarch Park, which is to, on evenings and weekends, have a staff person available throughout that period to be able to handle first level customer questions, customer disputes, customer problems. And then if they can't solve the problem, to be able to call a supervisory person in Parks and Recreation to be able to offer solutions as well. So there's obviously an additional cost to this. We think it's well worth it. Patriarch Park is a, is a busy facility with the pickleball courts, with, tennis, with the new um, baseball courts, I mean, baseball fields going in, the pavilion, lots of, lots of people, lots of activity. So we think it is, a, it is a good solution in terms of solving problems there and making sure we have customer service representatives on site. So that's something we'll be implementing as soon as possible. That's all, unless you have any questions about that, Mayor. Nope, that was it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Yaden. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've been asked to uh, talk about a number of things. They're all kind of tied together, so I will tie them together in, in my comments and, and hopefully not uh, miss any points that you asked me to discuss. If I do, please feel free to uh, point those out to me. But 
Um, so the, the questions all kind of revolve around what are our tools for uh, enforcement of, of what social distancing and controls of people gathering in, in areas where um, they perhaps shouldn't be under the governor's order. Um, so the, our, our current structure is section 1033 of our code allows us to declare a local state of emergency. And that's something that you have done since the inception of this crisis. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the powers under that act, which, which that refers to are, are fairly limited. It says that we can adopt a local state of emergency and then pursuant to that issue directives as to travel restrictions on county or local roads. So those are your, that's your authority under a local state of emergency. Uh, arguably, that could include some, um, you know, directives as to, uh, you know, pedestrian traffic as well as, as uh, um, street traffic or vehicular traffic, but uh, the, the, I don't know that that was the intent of that provision was to allow us to control uh, pedestrian crowds. And certainly we could only do so on local roads. So that would preclude us from, um, um, you know, Michigan Avenue and, and Grand River, which are state trunk lines. So the authority only applies to local county or local roads. So beyond that, um, the authority is given to, for, for this type of control, the authority is given to the governor, who has quite broad powers under emerge state of emergency and, and has been exercising those powers through, I think, uh, around 130 executive orders at this point. Uh, the uh, other authority is given to the uh, county health officials. So under the state law, so that's uh, section 2451 and section 2453 of the public health code allow the county officials to order uh, specific actions to be taken to prohibit the presence of individuals in locations or under conditions where imminent danger exists. It also empowers the local health officer uh, to, if they determine a pandemic is necessary to protect, or if they determine there is a control of an epidemic is necessary to protect the public health. They have broad powers uh, to establish procedures to be followed by persons, including local government entities, to ensure continuation of essential public service, services and enforcement health laws. So those are um, the powers that are given to the governor and the um, local health official that are specifically not given to us by the state law. And, and that's where I have concern about us trying to um, enact ordinances or laws that would allow us, give us the authority to take those actions rather than leave them where the state has, has left them. Uh, for instance, uh, if I, I, I think some other cities have adopted uh, local state of emergency ordinances where they've given themselves broader authority to take certain actions. But when you're really talking about uh, restricting people's constitutional rights, um, that there's a good argument that, you know, the state law gives this authority to the people who, who, are expertise, who have expertise in the area, the health official, and it wasn't given to us on purpose. So that when we try to step in and, and, and infringe on people's First Amendment freedoms, I uh, have real concerns that we're gonna, we would end up liable for um, taking those type of actions. So the next question that kind of arises out of this is, is well, what tools do we have to, that we can enforce that, that are currently in existence? And uh, the one question I get a lot is what about the uh, governor's executive orders? Governor has issued orders that make it a misdemeanor to violate the orders of the governor under certain circumstances. Um, so the, the governor has issued an order that says that um, 
bars and restaurants must put up signage and so forth. And, and there's very specific guidelines on what bars have to do uh, to uh, help enforce the social distancing. Um, the, the unfortunate part of all this with all the governor's orders is we don't get to be the ones that prosecute those uh, violations. Our office, the city has no control once, once a, a violation is issued that either goes to the Ingham County Prosecutor's Office or to the Attorney General's Office for enforcement. So we don't, if we try to enforce that, we don't have any control of the end result. Um, the, the, um, the governor's order currently does not require face masks when you're outside. When you're outside, the, the governor's current order requires people to social distance uh, maintain six feet of distance between uh, themselves and others. It, it says that, specifically it says that uh, people leaving home have to follow social distancing measures recommended by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, including remaining at least six feet from people from outside the individual's household to the extent feasible under the circumstances. So that, that language to the extent feasible under the circumstances concerns me because that's really not defined anywhere in the order when it's feasible and when it's not feasible. Uh, also, it, when, we, when we talk about enforcing in a line situation, for instance, an officer could go up and say, well, you're not six feet from the person behind you and, and, the, and the person that they say that to says, well, that's the person behind me's fault, not mine or you're not six feet from the person in front of you. And they say, well, I was until I got crowded together by the, the people behind me and I tried to maintain my distance from them. So there's gonna be a lot of arguments that, well, I was, I, was, I was doing fine, but it wasn't feasible under these circumstances to maintain the, the six foot distance requirement. So I have, even if we were to now, obviously we can ask for compliance. We can, an officer or some other individual could go around and ask that people comply with the order, advise them of the order, um, tell them that it's required and see what kind of compliance we can get. The, the issue that I see comes from uh, when people refuse that compliance and refuse to voluntarily comply, what enforcement actions can we take at that point? And, and my advice would be to just simply, if you can get their name and seek a complaint more through the prosecutor's office, because we don't, we can't write tickets for this. Um, and we shouldn't be writing tickets for this because uh, quite frankly, we don't wanna take the liability of trying to enforce these orders where it should be the state's responsibility to take the liability to take the liability. Once we start making custodial arrests or, or writing tickets for violation of, of uh, an executive order, we're subjecting to the city to a significant amount of potential uh, civil liability. Um, and um, when the law says that when you are allowed to infringe on people's constitutional rights, for instance, such as in a, in a pandemic situation, that you have to do so in the least restrictive means possible. Uh, that there's a strict scrutiny test that the courts apply to see if if the um, least uh, restrictive measures were were done. So I, I don't know that we would want to um, try to try to enforce these orders based on those tests that the courts are going to that the courts are going to use to see if this was the strict the least restrictive means possible of, of infringing on somebody's rights. So like, like you said earlier, Mayor, the, the constitution allows people to do things that may not be in their best interests or may not be in everyone's best interests. The right to assemble is one of them. So I, I have real concerns about us trying to enforce executive orders. Um, the, the, there is another provision of, of the law in the state motor vehicle code that um, talks about um, 
that it, well, it, it reads as follows, that uh, a person without authority shall not block, obstruct, impede, or otherwise interfere with the normal flow of the vehicular or pedestrian traffic upon a public street or highway in this state uh, by means of barricade, object, or device, or with his or her person. So uh, that, that provision under the Motor Vehicle Code arguably could be used to um, preclude people from gathering in lines on sidewalks. Um, I have some concerns of, of that just because historically we, we haven't done that and historically there there have been lines uh, so when 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 and if we enforce this through that this measure um, now it's going to be clear to people that we're not enforcing it to uh, stop or to allow the free flow of pedestrian or vehicular traffic it's going to be clear that we're enforcing it because of a, a pandemic situation and Again, that's not the, the purpose of, of that particular section. So uh, again, um, with regard to the farmer's market um, and wearing masks in the farmer's market, uh, that the executive order doesn't require that at, at this stage. It, if you're outside, you're only required to social distance. Um, certainly, we get to make rules regarding our uh, farmer's market, um, reasonable rules. That isn't one of them that they have to wear a mask at this time. Arguably, we could amend our rules to, to require uh, uh, people to wear masks. Uh, the question again becomes from an enforcement standpoint, what do you do if somebody simply refuses to comply? And they said, I'm just here to get some, some uh, vegetables and I'll leave. Um, you know, I'm not going to go get a mask or put a mask on. So the question is, is, well, it's a rule of our market. Um, we could exclude them, arguably, if, if they're refusing to go, do we, do we then try to argue that they're a trespasser and arrest them? Or do we, or do we, take, you know, tell them they should leave? And then if they refuse, um, take some other action, but but uh, a lot of this all comes down to the fact that um, the enforcement level is a problem from my standpoint. We can ask for voluntary compliance for all of this stuff, clearly. Um, but the issue comes when somebody says, no, they're not gonna voluntarily comply and that they, they're just gonna go about their business. What actions do we take next? And unfortunately, there's not a lot of good options for us. The, uh, the blocking of the sidewalk provision that I talked about in the Motor Vehicle Code, that's a civil infraction. We used to have that as a misdemeanor offense in our disorderly conduct code. We took that away because it was a civil infraction under state law. So the, the, the most you could do is write someone a ticket uh, for uh, this uh, civil infraction citation for blocking the sidewalk if they refuse to, to go. But again, I had, I'd have real concerns about that because it's going to be pretty evident that we're using this provision in a manner we have not used it before and that our purpose is for public safety under a pandemic issue rather than uh, clearing the sidewalks for pedestrian traffic. Um, my understanding, I, I haven't been downtown in, in the late evening in a long time, but my understanding is that the lines do allow uh, pedestrian traffic to get by. Uh, clearly, if, if they don't, uh, that can be a problem. Um, I was asked, so the, the other thing that was brought up was uh, just shutting down the businesses altogether and, and whether we have the authority to do that. And, and we don't now, like I said, enforcement of the executive orders is through the prosecutor's office and the uh, attorney general's office. They have the ability for violations of the emergency order to, to certainly take actions that might shut a business down. I suspect that they would be reluctant to do that. 
Uh, if we try to do that, uh, the argument will be clearly that, well, if if the go if the governor wasn't if the prosecutor wasn't willing to prosecute it and shut down the business, and if the AG's office wasn't willing to shut down the business, and the county health officer said that they're not willing to make orders to shut down the business, where's your expertise lie in you shutting down the business to, to protect the public health and safety? Uh, clearly, if we shut down a business, uh, we face uh, just a direct lawsuit with, with pretty clear uh, damages on the part of the business's part. They, they'll have records to show how much business they usually had and how much business they lost. Um, so exercising that kind of authority, uh, again, really exposes the city to a lot of potential civil liability. Now, obviously, um, you know, it is a pandemic and, and council may decide that they're willing to take the risk of, of the civil liability and, and adopt ordinances and so forth that, that would allow the council or the city manager or someone to shut down a business. But that, I can't recommend that based on um, my understanding of the law at this stage. Uh, but again, that's, you know, whether council, because of the priorities that it has for, um, you know, dealing with this pandemic wants to take some actions that are somewhat suspect in my mind, that uh, that's up to council. That's a policy decision, but it would be against my recommendations. Did I answer? Okay. It does. It does answer. Take a drink of water, Tom. Jeez, I don't think you even <laughs> breathed during that. Uh, Mr. Stevens, you had a question, and then other council people who want to uh, talk to ask questions of Tom. And hey. Mr. Lahan, Mr. Lahanis also just told me that Chief Chalaferro would like to uh, weigh in. Oh, that's great. Uh, do you want to do that now, Mr. Stevens, or or do you want can to ask I, questions? Can I ask a few questions? Yeah. Just we'll, because we'll, we're talking about the issues, and then sure. we'll talk to Mr. Yaden first, and then we'll bring in Mr. Chalaferro. Awesome. Is that okay, uh, George? Yeah. So to great. Um, so I have a couple questions to Mr. Yaden and then probably a couple questions for George. Um, so, um, Tom, so based on, on your explanation, we obviously don't have the authority to, to shut down a business based on, on, on these things that you said. It was, it's inadvisable if we do that. So the, the county health official would have that authority if, for instance, they were letting in people without masks, right? That is, they were having people indoors that did not have masks at all. I mean, I understand outdoors and distancing and I'll get to that in a second, but, but specifically letting in people without masks. Well, they could, the, the county health official could make a rule that says you can't do that and then enforce their own rule. Yes. Okay, but, so we don't have that rule at this point then? My understanding was that you had to have the masks indoors based on the executive I, order. I don't know that we have that rule from the county. The, the county health officer is not going to enforce the state's executive orders. They're going to enforce their own rules and regulations. Okay. So what I would really love to see, um, maybe it comes from the city manager's office and only if council's on board is a recommendation to the county health officials to make that a rule. And I mean specifically on letting people in without masks. Not, not, I'm not necessarily talking about the lines. I'm not talking about anything else, but I'm talking about the risk indoors of having folks. I know eating and drinking is, you know, they're not going to have the mask on, but letting people in without masks in a confined space, I think they, they have bouncers at the, at the door of bars. And I'm not just talking about Harper's. I'm talking about a lot of other bars for them to check ID and then check to make sure that they have a mask. I don't think it's an unreasonable thing. Um, and then I want to, have some sort of communication. Uh, Mark, go ahead. Do you have a comment on that specifically? I, I do, and it's only this. Uh, this is, uh, you know, council member comments, and, it, and we've kind of gotten way beyond that with this discussion. And when you you said only if council, other council members agree, I, I feel like we're we're sort of on an edge of an OMA 
violation here. We did not notice this conversation. This is totally spontaneous, I realize. Right. But I think we've gone way, way further than our agenda that we adopted actually allows us to go at this point in time. Okay. Um, Let me hang on, Mr. Hang on, Mr. Stevens and Mr. Meadows. Uh, so I asked um, Mr. Yaden in his comments to um, ask to address these questions because I knew they would come up tonight. And then um, I also asked people to not ask the same question of Tom until he was finished. So even even is this okay then to continue, Mr. Yaden? Uh, discussions are fine. I think uh, what uh, Councilmember Meadows was worried about was the emotion kind of situation taking yeah. place okay. in the context of, of this. But, but you're free to discuss it. The question is, is if you make a motion of some sort, it might not have the validity that you, you would otherwise have of a motion that was properly noticed. Understood. Back off, I, oh. Back off Stevens. Understood, and I appreciate that. Maybe we can have a conversation because we don't have a meeting for a few weeks about noticing an, another, maybe even discussion meeting where we can talk about COVID responses specifically. I think that, you know, I'm, I'm down for more meetings. I apologize if you guys are not, but um, a second question to Tom, specifically on what you said, no going, or uh, this is actually to George based on Tom's response. So we have, at this point, we, I, I think we, and this is city attorney's job, sure, but we've jumped from, um, doing nothing to what the enforcement would look like. So we have not at this point tried to just ask people to distance and or um, ask folks to wear masks at the farmer's market. Like voluntarily. Our understanding is we are. So yes, in city hall, we ask people to put masks on. So my understanding is that's what we're doing at all of our areas, including the farmer's market. So I heard a complaint that, that we didn't do that with one set of people. But my understanding is we're asking people to wear masks. We certainly do it at City Hall and we're taking temperatures as well. But I don't, I don't, uh, or do you mean in the lines at Harper's? Because I know there's a sign up in Harper's has been requesting that. I don't think it's been effective, but they've been asking. Yeah. So, I mean, just as like, if we're going to have folks around, like, and I, and I'm, you know, I, I envision as, weird as this sounds, a conversation where if we're working with Harpers and somebody's refusing to, to put on a mask or socially distance, you know, they're not getting into the bar, right? That's not an enforcement. We're not at arresting somebody. But if, you know, if the establishment wants to be a partner with that and they can tell people not to come in based on the fact that they don't have a mask, I mean, I feel like that's a good partnership right there that doesn't require an arrest. That's just something, you know, kind of thinking out of the box. So, um, if that is the policy currently, and of course, if it is, I'm not making a motion on this, I would want to make that clear that city employees, especially at farmers markets, and hopefully during times where even there's a line outside, we are asking people to socially distance. If that's not working, if we really do need to get in the conversation of enforcement, I'm happy to have that at our next meeting, maybe a discussion meeting um, in between this and the next one. But if we can try that um, and have unarmed folks either, you know, with masks to give out or just telling people to distance themselves um, while they're in line, I think it would be, it would be helpful to see if, if, if people respond. I, I'm hoping that the majority of people, um, and I know I'm saying this probably out of ignorance, but would comply if somebody asked them, hey, step a couple of feet away. Um, and if it doesn't work, then, then we have that conversation. But go ahead, Jesse. So are you asking now about our farmer's market? Are you asking for private lines to private businesses? Both. Yeah. So the, I, I think what Mr. Lahanis is getting at is we do not have those people, Mr. Stevens. Those would be police officers. I know. I'm saying unarmed, unarmed officers. I don't believe, I don't believe you can we don't ask have a police unarmed officer. police officers. Yeah. You can't ask a police officer to take off his gun. I don't believe. I think that would be a violation of their working conditions and they would win that grievance in like one minute. All right. Count, uh, Council member. of a state statute, actually. So. Yeah, there you go. Council member Greg. Um, so it's my understanding that we already do have police, our regular on duty police officers patrolling that area, just being present down there. 
Um, I do not think that it is unreasonable to ask those officers to encourage the people in line to socially distance in accordance with the executive order. I think deciding that we shouldn't ask because we cannot enforce it in every instance is not a great policy. I think we should ask. I think if somebody gets up in one of our officers face and gets jerky about it, that officer is free to say, you know, hey, I'm not going to pick a fight with you. I'm just trying to keep everybody safe. I don't think that we need to escalate it beyond that. I think we can simply ask people. Um, I don't think a lot of those kids, they're like 19 to 25, based on the cases that of the people that contracted the virus. I don't think they're maliciously going down there to violate the executive order. They're going down there to have fun and they're probably bunching up in line because they're hanging out with their friends. So if we just gently ask them to distance themselves, I think most of them will probably do it without a big problem, but we've got to ask them. I think we can also ask the bars to discourage lines until the emergency order is over. I think right now we're allowing people who are at capacity to line up on the sidewalk. I don't actually know where that tradition came from, um, why we're using public sidewalks for lines for private businesses. That's a separate discussion, but I think it's totally reasonable of us through the HRC, through some of our contacts with those business owners to just say, hey, you know, can you just ask your bouncers to tell people that we're not doing lines, that it's first come, first serve until the pandemic is over and see where that gets us. It's better than nothing. Um, and I think, you know, the, Ruth, to your point that you said we're in the same situation now as we were in the beginning, we're not. We have an executive order that says maintain six feet of distance. We can enforce that. We can decide the level of enforcement. And I think right now the level that would be appropriate is asking and see where that gets us. Okay, so uh, Council Member Greg, I learned my lesson on Saturday. I completely oppose sending the police to approach a line of young people. And I ask you just in a thought experiment and I don't even want an answer. Let's say this was a line of people lining up to get into a Black Lives Matter rally. Would you want to send a white police officer to that line asking them to socially distance? Um, I will answer that. I've been at some of those rallies. The organizers are actively engaging their participants and telling them to socially distance. They are handing out masks. They are telling them to socially distance. Our business owners are not doing that to the people in their line. Yeah, I, I asked, uh, uh, this was a mind experiment and I wasn't talking about facts. So let's say you have a line of African-Americans who are lining up who are not masks, right? You understand my point. I, I, don't, I don't want to belabor it. But what I'm saying is I am, I am against that because we do not have unarmed people to do that. And I do not want to send another officer who are, to, to intimidate a, a young person, even if it's a young white drunk our person. officers are already there, Ruth. They're already That's patrolling true. that area. They're already standing there. They're just not asking them to move back. That's true. And I think, you know, to your point, this is not an argument in a park. This is a public health pandemic, and we now have 22 confirmed cases from Harper's. It is not a thought experiment. We have 22 people who have contracted a deadly virus in one of our local businesses where we have officers stationed outside who are not enforcing a governor level protocol in the line. I take your point. Uh, Councilmember Stevens. So I would suggest that since we have a break, in between this and our next meeting, um, maybe we have the conversation of scheduling another meeting to talk about this specifically. I think we have a lot of thoughts and, and we actually, unlike the first time, we have a little bit of time. Um, we don't because people are still lining up right now, but I think that the there's gonna be a really big wave that hits when move-in comes in and in-person classes starts. And I and I I know that you know we are dealing with the situation right now and I agree 100% with Councilmember Greg. We have 22 cases right here. And I apologize. I spoke 14 during my Councilmember comments. It's confirmed 22 now, including one of the employees. So, um, but I, I think that we should have a meeting on this and, and talk about it further um, and figure out what we can do. Agreed. Can we schedule a meeting? And yet this week would work absolutely fine for me. Thank you. Can we invite Greg to be a part of that conversation as well? Who? I didn't hear who. 
Nope. The HRC, the Responsible Hospitality Commission. RHC, yeah. Right. Maybe even maybe even the county health official too, if that's a possibility. Okay, so let's leave this with Mr. Lahanis. Mr. Lahanis, can you see if you can schedule a meeting? Um, Mr. Yaden, sorry, Mr. Yaden, for that meeting, can you draft whatever ordinances we might be able to just pass to give us powers that may be may or may not be questionable? Yeah. Let's see. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Lohannes, I think the, de the, the desire is for at least three council members to have a meeting as soon as possible. But we wanna wait if we can schedule something that has all, of, we want all the council members or if we can't get everybody, do we still go forward? We want it this week. <laughs> I'd be fine with like, the reason why I mentioned that we have a big gap in between our next meeting, I'd be fine with maybe doing something next week, but having the RHC and, and maybe even a county health official there to, to work with us, I think is, is the imper imperative measure more than. All right. Or Greg, it's next week. We'll okay. get to work on it. Next week's fine, but I think we should definitely not wait until three weeks. We've got stuff happening right now, so. Okay, Councilor Babcock, is next week okay with you? Yes. Okay, there you go. Understood. All right, uh, Mr. Meadows. Right. Number one, I, I may not be able to make that meeting, but the, uh, the- Can you guys hear him? Mm -hmm. Mark, you're really- You gotta quiet. come closer. We discuss. There you go. There you go. I'm not clear on the, the point of the meeting. Is it to discuss whether we are gonna use armed police officers to tell people in line that they should maintain uh, social distancing? No, Because that's the, what I'm kind of hearing here. No, the point of the meeting is to discuss and then make decisions about what we want to do, which might include passing ordinances that allow us to close buildings if we think they're causing a pandemic to be spread. Okay, and, and uh, can't hear you. I heard from Tom earlier that we, I thought I heard from Tom earlier that we can't do that. No, he said it was against his advice. Can I say something, Ruth? Yes, of course. I think the purpose of the meeting would be to explore what options we have, engaging the businesses who are likely to have large crowds inside of them and outside of them within the context of all of our different levels of authority. Yeah, and, and my comment on having a meeting is more to be cognizant of, of your comment on having a discussion around items that we didn't notice before. So I wanted to have a discussion about this that is noticed um, when we make decisions. I'm good with that. But I want to, I think it would be advisable for us to have a written report from Tom as to the options that we have with regard to this and some advice with regard to it. So I don't know how long that takes. So I, I don't know if it's next week is my question. Are you good for next week, Mr. Yaden? You're muted, Tom. I, I will do my best. That's all I can promise. But yes, okay, I'll give you, you something. I'll give you something by next week. All right. Thank you. Okay. I think we are done with everybody's comments except for Mr. Talaferro. Good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge that we are, um, it, those of us that have some affiliation with the public safety aspect, understand your frustration and concerns and all the challenges around this issue. What I would share with you are a couple things. The governor's executive order um, did allow for medical exemptions for wearing masks. So there are, uh, it's very difficult to enforce for a number of reasons, not only um, those that were uh, mentioned by Mr. Yaden, but also because people can uh, still proceed to make entry if they have a medical condition. We have no way of, of affirming or disproving um, anyone that would make that um, statement. I think another important and very relevant thing here is that 
Um, a lot of the, the executive order, the power was vested with the um, governor and public health, because when you're dealing with the issues like um, infectious diseases, if you think back to the Ryan White Act and all of those things with HIV, um, there were communities and there were pushed by businesses to deny services to people that had certain infectious diseases. So while I understand this is a pandemic situation, and certainly um, I understand the concerns here. There were also concerns that people could be uh, improperly held and quarantined their, to their homes, not allowed to work and do other things. So this is something that I would also be conscious of. The governor's executive order did allow for up to hundred people to, um, to be in an outdoor activity. I think um, it would be questionable if this is an outdoor activity, however, um, I think it, that with that number, that presents certain problems to us as well, because um, obviously you can't have up to 100 if it were an event. I, again, you could confine event to picnic and other things. Um, but I do think that um, the mayor's um, point about the protesters becomes a valid point there, that when you're looking at a city street and you know, defining it up to 100 people within a two block air radius or a one block radius, it's going to be uh, much more difficult to enforce and be more problematic. And so while um, we certainly share your concerns, I think that the, the um, direction that was given by Mr. Yagan is uh, exactly correct that the, this falls is very explicitly addressed in the Public Health Code 368 1978. And then there's also as addressed in the uh, Michigan Emergency Management Emergency Operations Plan. I think that to the extent you, you can as a council um, lobby uh, those parties that may have the ability and the authority to make those decisions, which was the, um, the case we found ourselves in initially when the bars were lined up uh, with the initial actions. But again, I, I, would, I would also, um, in defense of uh, the county public health official, say that um, they are very reluctant to also take actions that are more stringent than those uh, recommended from the state public health office um, because of those same types of liability concerns about um, closing and shutting down businesses. So it is a challenge. Um, it, the help we can get from the university or public health um, is, is very much appreciated. Um, there are scenarios where you could call public health down and they may, um, if they are available, uh, go in and shut that facility at that particular time. But again, um, it would not be uh, something that could be very easily enforced with all of the exemptions that are included in the um, and the vague language in some of the executive orders. So I don't know if that helps at all, but um, I, there is some other um, public health reasons why those powers are vested at that level to prohibit uh, and, and restrict um, local communities and businesses from denying people access to other services as well. Yes, uh, Randy, that was very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, I've asked Mr. Lahanas to see if you are available uh, when we set that meeting next week, because that would be very helpful, along with somebody from public health. Okay, we are moving on to the consent agenda. Mr. Lahanas. Let me get my papers together. Hold on a second. Yeah, yeah. I'd let somebody else talk, but it's I only don't 10 care. No. I'm good. Uh, I think the following items on the consent agenda for council consideration, item 3.1, refer the following appointments or reappointments to boards or commissions. A, Jeff, Jeffrey J. Smith to the Downtown Development Authority for a term ending June 30th, 2020. B, Ruben Levinson to the Downtown Development Authority for a term ending June 30th, 2024. C, Kristen K. Clark to the Downtown Development Authority for a term ending June 30th, uh, 2024. D, Jeffrey J. Smith to the Brownfield Redevelopment Authority for a term ending June 30th, 2024. E, Ruben Levinson to the Brownfield Redevelopment Authority for a term ending June 30th, 2024. F, Kristen K. Clark to the Brownfield Redevelopment Authority for a term ending June 30th, 2024. Item 3.2, approve a contract with Lau Construction LLC in the amount of 27600 
for installation of a second teller window for the East Lansing City Clerk Office and authorize the city manager to sign and further approve a project contingency of $2,400. Item 3.3, approve a contract with TL Contracting Incorporated for miscellaneous contract and hazardous sidewalk repairs in an amount not to exceed $200,000 and authorize the city manager to sign the contract. Item 3.4, approve a contract with, with Verlind Excavating and Trucking for the fiscal year 2020 CDBG Albert Avenue Phase 3 sidewalk improvements in the amount of $190,891 and authorize the city manager to sign the contract. Item 3.5, approve an intergovernmental agreement for $600,000 with the Clinton County Road Commission to utilize their paving contractor to mill and resurface the Hannah Community Center parking lots and Abbott Road from Linden Street to Bircham Drive and authorize the city manager to sign. Item 3.6, approve a lease agreement between the city and Margaret F. Metzger and as trustee under revocable trust agreement of Margaret F. Metzger dated June 11, 1986 and Fabian Enterprises LLC to allow the city to continue to utilize parking lot 11 as part of the municipal parking system. Item 3.7, authorize the street closure of all northbound lanes on Harrison Road from Kalamazoo to Michigan Avenue and one southbound lane on Bogue Street from Grand River Avenue to Shaw Lane on Saturday, September 12, 2020, from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. for the rescheduled ISO 5K walk, run, walk, and roll race. Item 3.8, approve the Grove Alley closure, use of uh, Ann Street Plaza and use of Amplified Sound on Thursday, August 6, 2020, from 2 p.m. to 9 p.m. for the Lansing Chamber of Commerce Grub Crawl event. Item 3.9, approve a full and final settlement of a workers' compensation claim for a City of East Lansing employee for $8,500. Those are all the items on the consent agenda for Council's consideration. Thank you, Mr. Lahavis. Um, I'm going to move approval of the consent agenda. And can I have a second. second? Thank you, Mr. Stevens. It's been moved and seconded. Would anybody like anything removed from the consent agenda, Mr. Stevens? I just have a couple of questions on, on two of the items, if that's all right. Um, just a question on um, 3.6, um, that, that ground lease, uh, can you run us through kind of where we were on uh, that ground lease previously and where we are now, like what the changes to that contract look like? Yep, Mr. Farrenbach, uh, yeah, can you walk us Tom. through briefly? Yeah, thank you. I can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. So essentially we had a traditional lease agreement um, where the city pays the taxes. Uh, we also pay uh, uh, approximately $10,000 a month uh, for the use of, uh, of just over two thirds of the Bailey uh, lot, which is owned by uh, the Fabian and Metzger families. Uh, we had been in the process of renegotiating that lease um, and then were struck by COVID um, and we have uh, had to change course dramatically in terms of how to structure that lease. Uh, so what we've presented here is really a partnership between the city and the two families on a short term uh, basis for 14 months where we, uh, the city, provide uh, a limited guaranteed payment uh, and then split the costs, um, split the revenues uh, over our costs uh, with, with the two families. And I'd be happy to go into further details. I think I spelled it out in the memo, but yeah, no, and, and you did, and, and I and I appreciate that. Do you? Um, and this this might be not available to you right now, but do you have any of those projected revenues based on past years available to you? If you don't right now, that's okay. I could get it in an email form after. But actually, I'd appreciate if you if you just if you want to finalize that and just send it to everybody, Mr. Fahrenbach. So in terms of um, I, I'm just want to understand exactly what you're asking for in terms of based on past performance of the parking um, of Bar Bailey lot 11, what we might expect in terms yeah, of how I'm to, not, how I'm to not, break. I know that we're in COVID terms right now, I just, just because, because of the, the lease arrangement and the difference between that splitting of the cost, I just kind of want to know, you know, where our, our bottom line ended up just because we're going to be paying sure. for it and splitting costs on that. So. 
Um, so uh, so it's, it's included as exhibit A uh, in the lease document, uh, uh, sort of a breakdown of based on uh, projected revenues, um, what exactly would be the city's portion and what exactly would be the, the owner's portion. Okay. All right. So thank you. So for, I, I appreciate that, Tom. And then I had a question on one more item, if that's all right. Um, just the, I guess, kind of 3.7 on the ISO 5K run. Um, it's fairly far in advance. Um, I mean, have, we don't really know what's going to happen at this point. We got a lot of people coming back, and we just had a really long conversation on on COVID. And I mean, have you have you had any indications of safety precautions being made for that, or or other things that are? Yeah. So what I think is happening is that they're actually wanting to put it on the calendar so that potentially they could have the event. I think as they get closer, if they see that they can't, they will delay it again or have to cancel it. But I think that they wanted to have a placeholder essentially and then be able to have the event if it's possible at that point. But I think that they're aware of the, of the challenges that may come by that point. Okay. And then I guess same question for 3.8, if that's all right. So same thing as that. That's going to be a the more socially distanced event where people will be um, eating from, you know, sort of takeaway food and it'll be um, run okay. in a way that's socially distanced, not unlike our outdoor dining, but if okay. you want a more detailed explanation, I can have someone do that. Okay. I appreciate the answers to all those questions. Thank you. Any other questions, removals? All right. We have a motion and it's been seconded. All those approve, uh, agreeing to approve the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. The consent agenda has been adopted. Next, we're going to 4.1 on the business agenda. Consideration of Ordinance 1847, an ordinance to change the closing time of the open area dining areas to 9 p.m. Mr. Lahanas. Yeah, so this is a pretty simple thing. Obviously, when we started this, we were coming up with what we thought was our best estimate of time to be able to give people to enjoy the downtown dining area, but not go too late into the evening. I think on further reflection and having more time to see the bar crowd coming into the downtown, uh, myself and the police chief thought that 9 p.m. would be a better time to end the outdoor dining, including alcohol, just really to give more separation potentially between the outdoor diners who are having alcohol at the tables and the crowd coming down potentially to go to the bars. So we thought that this would allow it to be a little bit more um, easy to uh, to uh, maintain the separation, like we said, and, and limit the outdoor dining until later in the night. So recommending to 9 p.m. I move approval of ordinance 1487. Can I get a second? I'll second. Second by uh, the mayor pro tem. Any questions or discussions? I think we'll um, probably have a bigger conversation about this next week or whenever we meet, but um, would like to just know um, updates maybe at that meeting on how this is going, how you perceive um, the outdoor dining areas, that reduction of hours from 10 p.m. to 9 p.m. as the as the main pervasive issue in, in our role in and making sure that people are socially distanced, or if there's other measures that we can that we should be taking in terms of our outdoor dining. Our minds are thinking a lot tonight, Mr. Stevens. I was going to ask the same question. Oh, nice. Uh, when we meet in the next time, I, I would like to, to assess whether or not this has worked out and it's been a good idea at all. Um, just because whenever I go by, it doesn't seem to be working as intended. So I, I'd be looking for your views on that. Yep. So just anecdotally, Our, last night I walked through at uh, 8.30 and saw about 10 tables full, all the people eating and drinking food from local restaurants. So I was <laughs> extremely impressed. It doesn't always look that clear. Sometimes people are just drinking, but I was extremely impressed last night for one, and I've been going through most nights. So, okay, great. Happy to do it. All right. That. Any other comments? All right. All those in favor of uh, Ordinance 1487, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign? All right. Uh, Ordinance 1487 is adopted. Next is 4.2, discussion of downtown parking and consideration of additional temporary rate changes for the downtown parking system. Mr. Lahanas, uh, Mr. Shero. Mr. Yeah, Fehrenbach. Mr. Fehrenbach is gonna walk us through a brief Mr. presentation. Ah. 
I knew I was going to get one of them. <laughs> Greetings. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, clearly, uh, if you want to move, move the slide, please. Uh, clearly, there's still uncertainty ahead for our business districts due to the pandemic. Uh, we don't know exactly what the future will hold for visitorship and other types of activity that generate demand for hourly and park permit parking. In the meantime, our structural costs remain. Uh, if you could please move ahead. In mid-May, uh, we had a discount a uh, discussion with the council about parking. Uh, some of the financial realities we're facing as a uh, enterprise and also how best to balance uh, the parking enterprise with using parking as a tool to incentivize shoppers, diners, and others to return downtown. On May 26th, the council directed staff to reprogram the gates to allow for the first two hours of any visit um, to a gated lot or structure to be free of charges until the end of June. This action was in conjunction with other actions meant to encourage the use of our system to help customers while deferring or cutting as many costs as possible. Uh, and as we approach the end of June, we're at a new decision point for the council uh, and want to provide data to help the council make the, a determination in terms of next steps. So if you please move slides. So note this data is still preliminary, uh, but it should provide good insight into where we are. Uh, so in looking at the March to mid June period um, between 2019 and 2020, uh, we're down nearly $800,000 in terms of expected revenues. Uh, so significantly, uh, we've brought in uh, approximately $520,000 um, in, in the period this year Whereas in the period last year, we are, we are at nearly 1.3 million. Um, this is mainly due to the gates being open uh, during the stay at home order, which obviously had a deleterious effect on, on revenues. Uh, and as we look uh, to just the partial period of, of June, where we've had the two hours uh, free with the gates down, uh, we're looking at about $95,000 in revenue whereas last year we were at about 170,000 for the same period. Next slide, please. Certainly the, the numbers suggest that the two hour free parking has had a positive effect uh, in terms of visits. There were over 25,000 uh, for this period, which is about 80% of our normal expectations in a non COVID situation. However, it should be noted uh, that only 3,790 3, of the transactions resulted in payment. Um, in terms of expenses, um, our reduced operations and other, I think you can go to the next slide, please, sorry. In terms of expenses, our reduced operation and other cost cutting measures have resulted uh, in a savings of about 360,000 uh, comparative with the same period last year. Uh, and as you can see, we've had significant cost cutting measures in terms of staffing, uh, deferral of purchasing, deferral of projects and maintenance. Um, and if you wanna to go to the next slide here, it's just a comparison of the same period between 2019 and 2020 in terms of revenue and expenses. Next slide, please. It's important to note that the savings uh, we've we've managed uh, through deferred maintenance and equipment expenses is not really tenable uh, if we endeavor to operate a safe system and avoid costly emergency repairs and replacements in the long term. Uh, and here are some examples of repairs uh, on the left that are necessary. And certainly we've we've seen um, what happens in terms of long term deferral of maintenance um, with the uh, uh, needing to replace the Charles garage uh, entirely uh, and needing to replace a, an entire deck on the MAC garage due to deferred maintenance. Uh, on the right is equipment examples. Um, um, and they're all really necessary to keep the parking system safe and in operation. Um, as we are well aware, uh, emergency repairs tend to be very costly. Next slide, please. So, the system itself is facing very serious challenges um, and staff has significant concerns about managing our, our fixed costs. So in weighing this serious situation we're in, 
staff put our heads together um, and came up with the following uh, recommendations, uh, essentially to return the system to somewhat normal, uh, but to continue efforts to support businesses. Um, and um, these would mainly include uh, the, the, the 15-minute grace period, which was uh, discussed and recommended by the parking task force uh, at all gated lots and structures, um, to uh, dedicate additional service spaces for pickup areas for local shops and restaurants. Uh, we've been piloting an area in, in the Bailey lot, uh, and we'd like to essentially expand that throughout the, the system. Um, we do like the idea of considering um, parking voucher giveaways uh, to get free parking directly to, to customers as best as possible. Um, it would help us avoid some of the long-term parkers uh, we've experienced who uh, simply move from lot to lot um, in the free areas to avoid charges. Um, and if council wanted to consider this, they could, uh, for instance, approve up to a certain amount uh, that we could dole out uh, to uh, to the appropriate businesses throughout the district. Uh, we, we do endeavor to work with the DMB to create promotional activities um, that are in line with events and, and uh, other, other sort of measurable programs. Uh, and of course, continue the validation and, and passport uh, business support programs. Uh, further, um, we're open to other ideas. Uh, we'd love to look into targeting free parking for limited periods of time, uh, including off-peak times. Uh, and uh, with that, we're open to council feedback and consideration. We expect this to be a work in progress for quite some time and to return to council again with, uh, with more data and more ideas for future consideration. Thank you. Mr. Yes, so at this point, we're looking for um, Basically, if council has any further direction for us, otherwise we will go to the 15 minutes as prior directed. So any further direction for us, otherwise July 1 will be reverting. Uh, Mr. Uh, council Member Greg. Um, I, the, the numbers are quite convincing, Tom. <laughs> Half a million dollars is a lot of money. Um, but also downtown is by no means open and the businesses down here are still having just an absolute, um, I don't know. I um, I wanted to grab lunch the other day and like the first three businesses that I thought to call to order from are still closed down because they don't have enough customers to open. Um, and so if we want our downtown to come back to anything like normal, which I know normal is like a really loaded word right now, um, going back to paid parking just seems heartbreaking kind of. Although that seems like a hard word to apply to parking. <laughs> yeah, who doesn't love parking? Um, and I know I know the money is terrible, but could we do a half hour grace period instead so that people had some time to linger downstairs, downtown before having to be parked? And then I know like I, I have validation tickets. I'll start validating as soon as we start doing it. But, um, you know, so, and I can communicate that to my customers, but there's a lot of people that still just, don't get that system and really feel averse to paying for parking. So, Councilmember Babcock. Hi, I would support certainly a half hour grace period. And also I'd, I'd request that we do a lot to tell people that they're going to have to pay for parking after a half hour so it doesn't come as a total shock. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Stevens, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stevens. Thanks. Um, it's all good. Um, so Tom, when you guys were talking about, um, a number to give out for vouchers, did you have an estimation in mind? Uh, we did. So, uh, essentially, you know, we, we estimate there's probably around 150, uh, businesses that would be kind of in the restaurant service, um, retail, uh, realm, uh, our experience with the, um, construction period was that, you know, not, not every business was interested in, in the vouchers and of the folks who did get the vouchers, um, you know, only, I think less than half, Mr. Sheriff might know off the top of his head, 
we're we're actually um, validated, which means that we actually had to pay, you know, or pay the opportunity cost for those. Um, so we were thinking, you know, if if we were to provide, for instance, a hundred uh, thirty minute vouchers um, to uh, one hundred and fifty visitors, one hundred one hundred and fifty companies, that that could be kind of a, a working number and be, in, you know, probably in the range of. Um, Ten to fifteen thousand dollars of total exposure, of which, you know, probably um, around half would would actually be um, validated. So, um, based on, I mean, has so have we had any conversation with um, DMB on the, or was this a conversation at any DMB meeting or RHC or? I know I I was at the last <laughs> couple of DDA meetings, so I don't think it came up there, but. Um, I mean, just where folks are at on on the business front, because I what I what I don't want to do is I, I have heard anecdotally that this is helping, um, but I, what I don't want to do is make a decision based on, um, you know, uh, we might lose money and it's and it's not actually helping. So I, I just kind of um, want to know if we've gotten any feedback from businesses on this that has been positive, negative. Um, do we have any sense of who's actually using the parking? Are they shopping downtown or is it construction workers or, you know, what kind of what's going on? So we've certainly heard feedback that, you know, people are appreciative and, and think that it does, it does help. Um, you know, the, the question is how many of the 25,000 visits um, resulted in people shopping or dining? And that's, that's a very uh, difficult, if not impossible number to determine which is part of the reason why we like vouchers, um, because we can track them to individual uh, businesses. Um, we, we're not always assured that, you know, they're going to end up in the hands of, of, of uh, customers, although, you know, we do our best to try to communicate that that's the, that's the intent. But at least we can kind of uh, measure the effects uh, on a per business basis. Okay, so where do we want to go? So we've got a 15 minute proposal from staff. We've heard from Ms. Greg and Ms. D Ms. Babcock. Uh, they appreciate the 30 minutes better. Mr. Meadows. I agree with uh, Council Member Babcock. And I I'm not sure what we're supposed to do here, but do we need a motion? Uh, uh, no. I think, uh, if, if we, we do it no. no. Yes. No. Sorry. If we do nothing, it will revert to. Um, the original, the, the, the old strategy of, uh, of charging. Is that correct, Mr. Lattis? Yeah, so I think without any action, we go to 15 minute grace period. I think we need council action if you wanna do something different. So I'd recommend a motion and just directing us what to pay. I mean, what, what's the free period for July? And then if you wanna do it again, perhaps after that, but hopefully July. Mr. Meadows? A motion to adopt the the recommendations, except for <clears throat> moving from two hours to one half hour through the end of July. I'll second that. that. I'll second that, Mr. Meadows. Would you like to I speak on that? Okay. Can I find something? Yes, uh, of course. Um, right now we have two hours free, and I think what we're talking about is a half hour grace period, which is a very different thing. Yeah, so uh, just a clarity thing, uh, the free parking is like, for example, 30 minutes of free parking would be off of anybody's stay would be 30 minutes. A grace period, which we initially had in place, was a five minutes. If you're in and out on that time frame, you're free. Um, so if we did a 30 minute grace period, if you're in and out in that 30 minutes, then you're free. But it's not 30 minutes off of everybody's transaction. So that's and the that's clarity. And that's what you proposed, yes. Mr. Meadows? Yes. That, that is what I thought. Uh, yep. Babcock proposed, and I proposed as well. Okay. Uh, so that is what Mr. Meadows proposed. That is what I seconded. Uh, Councilmember Babcock. Wait. I, actually, I want to ask Jesse. Mm -hmm. Does the grace period work better or free parking? Oh, well, that's I mean, a. <laughs> free parking would be better, but we can't afford it. I think a grace period kind of splits the difference it gives our customers or our downtown okay. customers our downtown visitors um let's hope they turn into customers a decent amount of time to shop at at least one business um okay. so if they want to come down and like pick up a prescription from cvs or you know pick up you know whatever noodles from noodles and company they can do that without having the clock pressure um but then if they end up staying for more 
downtown, then they will end up paying for their whole stay. So I think financially speaking, we have to start paying for parking again. We can't yeah. half a million dollars is a lot. So I think a grace period is a good, um, okay. yeah. I just wanted your insight into whether it was a good thing to do. Thank you. I think so, yeah. All right, anybody else? Okay, all those in favor of Mr. Meadows' motion, please vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, you have your direction, Mr. Lahanas. That motion has passed. Mr. Fahrenbach. Thank you. You had enough. All right, thanks, guys. All right, we are moving on to 4.3, consideration of a budget amendment to fiscal year 2020 for various funds in the combined amount of $1,532,935. Um, Ms. Kincaid. Hi, good evening. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yep, go ahead. All right, so we went through our traditional review process to look at current spending and then projected out to June 30th to make sure that we were gonna remain in budget compliance per the state of Michigan. Um, but we added a second layer, obviously, we wanted to see if there was any potential budget impacts um, from COVID-19 on the 2020 numbers. So we took into consideration any unanticipated costs, savings, potential loss of revenue, but we are mostly really concerned about funds that might go into a deficit that would need financial support from the general fund. So looking at the general fund, we're requesting an increase of $461,450. Um, we've identified potential loss of revenue from COVID in the amount of $943,000 from state jured revenue, fines and forfeiture and licenses and permits. Um, but on a positive note, we've also identified about $1.1 million of additional revenues from property taxes, income tax, and um, interest income. We have some additional expenditures in the general fund for public safety to accommodate many police retirements that we didn't have budgeted originally, but those will be partially offset by the economic development position that was um, held vacant for most of the fiscal year. Um, but then the most activity we have are in the um, transfers. So we took um, a hard look at the Parks and Recreation Fund and we had the department do a lot of looking into their operations and made sure that their, the closure of facilities and the cost savings from that or the loss of revenue from that where they might end the fiscal year. So we um, first wanted to make sure that they if they were going to be in a deficit, what we needed to provide to them. So we think that it's likely that they will end the year in a deficit. So we're, we're recommending to provide up to $150,000 to help maintain a $50,000 fund balance for the Parks and Recreation Fund. Then we similarly looked at the art festival, which had um, loss of revenue because of the cancellation of the traditional festival. And so we're considering helping the fund maintain a $10,000 fund balance, which would potentially um, require up to a $20,000 transfer from the general fund. Um, the primetime seniors fund, we're choosing to reduce the transfer to the seniors fund by $50,000 and provide that directly to the capital projects fund as um, sort of the kickoff of uh, the parking lot resurfacing of Hanna Community Center, which will happen starting in the next fiscal year and other funds are gonna to contribute to that as well, but it's going to um, just hit this fiscal year for the seniors fund. Then the Parks Capital Improvement Fund, we're choosing to provide an additional $80,000 to help with some cash flow issues because of all the, the reimbursement grants that they participate in. So the, um, this will bring the advance up to $200,000 for that fund, but the intent is that that will be returned once the, all the various projects are completed. And then finally, we're gonna have a little bit of savings in the garage fund because um, the low acuity vehicle that was purchased actually came in a little bit less than we had anticipated and budgeted. So with all of that, it's going to result in a potential additional use of fund balance for the general fund of about $276,000. And that is going to end the year with potentially a $1 million use of fund balance for the general fund. Any questions on the general fund before I continue? Any questions? Okay, continue. Thank you. Okay. 
Then the next largest area is the income tax fund where we um, had additional revenue of $778,000. So um, we were able to uh, do an additional transfer to the general fund for public safety support and the allocation for infrastructure for major local streets and park CIP. And then we were also able to support an additional $400,000 supplemental pension payment out of the income tax fund. So because I'm sure you're wondering, um, the income tax fund year to date amount that for supplemental pension payments was $2,484,000. And that's on top of general fund supplemental pension payments. So our total year to date supplemental payments are $5.5 million. Um, and then I'm gonna actually skip to the DMB um, that's requesting an increase of $31,700. They received some additional support from the DDA and MSU Greek Life in the fall for marketing and business relations. And then recently the DDA also approved additional support of $20,000 for promotional activities to encourage visitors to come back downtown. Then the remaining funds are really sort of the offset to all the transfers that I talked about in the general fund and the income tax fund, but I can speak to any of them individually if you would like. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Kincaid? Thank you. All those in, in favor, oh, no, sorry. I move approval of the budget amendments ha, as just described to us for various funds of the combined amount of $1,532,935. Can I get a second? A second. By the I... Mayor Pro Tem. Any questions? Okay. Um, sorry. Councilman we, we have two. Yeah, sorry. Um, well, I had a, my question was about the police retirements. Um, I think we've all established that I'm interested in our police budget right now. Um, so, um, and I guess I'm, my fear is that those are like morale related retirements or was this from some- Yeah, so I can, I can speak to that. Yeah. So typically we have a situation where lots of people could be eligible to retire across the city but because there are payouts that are significant, we try to use an estimate of what we think will act, who will actually leave, because a lot of times people are eligible, but they don't leave. So mm -hmm. if maybe there are 10 people eligible, we may put aside enough resources for five people. And typically we've gotten pretty good at guessing. In this situation, we estimated about half and we got just about everyone who wanted to go who was eligible. So you could say that there's just a, you know, a a bad guess on our part perhaps, but I think that what actually happened is perhaps people um, with a sense of law enforcement decided that they didn't, that they were ready to end their careers at this point and retire and go on to something else. That's my speculation, but uh, we did have a heavier than expected. We usually estimate about half and we had heavier than expected. Okay, this has been but a we long do, meeting. We do have uh, I just, I want to follow up, I guess, with you, maybe, I think we've got a meeting scheduled on Friday, just like where that leaves yep. us in terms of officers and, you know, just, it's on my mind. I can get an email to council because we just had that question. So we can get an email to council because we have three people in the academy currently to fill those because we anticipated a level of departures. Okay. Uh, thank you, council member Greg. Council member Stevens, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I was debating kind of asking this, but we just, Audrey, and and I will say this, Jill's not here, but I will say it for Jill, I trust you guys 100% um, when you're telling me these things and telling me where the fund balance needs to be. But we did have a conversation during the budget process of like different funds needing to be at different fund balances and the council policy being kind of overall um, at, what was it, it was a 15? Sorry, eight to 15. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought it was 16 for some reason for a second there. Um, but yeah, I, I was wondering if we, if we ever followed up and, and had the conversation with some staff folks about maybe establishing, you know, the fact that the income tax fund needs to be at a certain level for the next few years or um, kind of different fund balances for different actual parts of our budget. Was that ever discussed after our budget meeting? Um, I think we were still focusing on the 18, 15, eight to 15% for the time being. Um, but we're definitely working on that, especially trying to figure out where the income tax fund lies right now. Okay, I just want I just want to keep that part of the conversation, just because um, if we're going to be you know setting goals for these things, I want them to, you know, I want us to be able to kind of hold ourselves accountable to them. So mm -hmm. um, that's about it. I appreciate the uh, work on this. Okay, 
any other questions, comments? All right, all those in favor of the uh, motion, please note, please sit, ind indicate by saying aye, aye. 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 Any I saw you, Mr. Meadows. Any opposed? Same sign. Okay, uh, the motion has passed. Thank you very much, Ms. Kincaid. All right, now we're here moving on to two discussion items. Hang on, I lost my last page, here we go. Number 4.4, .4, a formal request, the city attorney draft a criminal statute creating a 90 day misdemeanor for weaponizing the police. Um, Council member Babcock, I think you are our, our staff person on this. Um. I'm not staff, but I'm council. Yeah, but, that's, that's um, how we've always done this, though. If a council person has a, I was just kidding about staff, obviously, yeah. it has a motion, has a, an item themselves, uh, unless you want a staff person to speak, you can you can speak to it. Well, um, first off, this is, again, a proposal. It is part of addressing uh, local and national concerns about racially based policing. Unfortunately, we've had this experience here where people who are living very ordinary lives find themselves the subject of police calls, um, walking their dogs, um, hanging out. Probably the highest profile recent example has been the guy who was in Central Park birding and a woman called the police on him. Um, because we've had it happen here and we don't want it to ever happen again, my proposal is that we create a 90 day misdemeanor for what's colloquially called weaponizing the police. Um, this differs from, from filing a false police report because it is targeted because of an individual's race, religion, ethnicity, disability, anything that makes them different from the person who's making the political, making the police call. And because it is, well, and also it is something that is fictitious or trumped up. Um, an example of making a false police report would be me losing my grandmother's ring and, um, thinking, I know, I'll call police and report that it was stolen, uh, that my house is broken into. That's a, that's a bad thing. That's a terrible thing. Weaponizing the police is taking a situation and exaggerating it. So police come in often expecting a far more extreme situation than they're really facing and using that as a, to, to target people um, so in that case, instead of me calling and saying, you know, I've asked my neighbors several times to be quiet. It's after midnight. Um, you know, can, can you just go talk to them? Weaponizing the police would be someone saying there's this large group of particular individuals. They're just outside my bedroom. They're allowed and, and they're threatening me and I'm afraid. Police then get that call and they go in with the mentality that there's some sort of assault situation. That is weaponizing the police. Um, I know Council Member Stevens may have some things to say about this. And Council Member Meadows months ago had inquired, was, excuse me, of City Attorney Yaden, and we did get some proposed language from him this evening. So perhaps it'd be most appropriate for me to hand over the floor. Oh, um, hang on, Councilmember Babcock. So what you are trying to do here is to ask the city to draft um, language and you, and we and you say we have received that language? We have. Unfortunately, I got it just before the meeting and haven't really okay. had a chance to look at it. Well, that's that's OK, because we're not we're not actually voting on anything today. We're just we're going to ask for the language and then we will discuss it at another time, essentially, is what you're saying. OK, Correct. Councilmember Meadows. I think this is uh, actually a very good idea for us to proceed on this. Until we saw uh, this language that Tom sent out uh, earlier this evening, uh, I thought we'd have to request that uh, some language be drafted. I think the, the way that we should proceed 
is to go ahead and have this language that Tom sent, which does say that the violation is a violation when based upon, in significant part, a person's race, color, or natural national origin, which is exactly what we were trying to get at. So um, I think we have the language and we can work on that language, but uh, I think it'd be better to get a copy of a proposed ordinance, get it on an agenda as a business item so that we can set a public hearing for it. And then we can work out any changes in the language as we go forward. So that's my suggestion. I, I like that idea. Councilmember Babcock, is that good with I you? Think that's great. And Mr. Yadin, can you do that? Yeah, Mayor, um, earlier this afternoon, I, I did send out some language that for an ordinance that was requested back in March. Okay. Uh, so I recopied everyone with that. If they okay. want change, if they want changes uh, to that language, I can make those before it's introduced. So just somebody let me know if any changes are needed to the, the ordinance before it's introduced. Okay. And then you'll get that on the next agenda, Mr. Lahanas. Correct. Okay. Perfect. All right. Then I guess we can move on to 4.5. Um, Councilmember Babcock. Thank you. Again, this is an item. It's certainly not the whole solution. It, it's, it's part of it. It's an idea. Um, I have drafted language that would create a temporary police oversight response. The key word here is temporary. Um, I think I speak for many on council when I say that we were humiliated is not too strong a word to discover after the casino incident that there had been a prior incident that we were not informed about. Um, this proposal would put, would, would require forwarding that information to us, the city council, to the Human Relations Commission, to what we're briefly calling, abbreviatedly calling the Study Commission, committee, excuse me, the city manager and others. Uh, this proposal would oh, there we go. Uh, ask that the diversity officer and the Human Relations, well, first that, that information um, of a report, of a, excuse me, a complaint, I'm sorry, it's getting late, of a complaint filed against the police or when force is used um, would have to be forwarded to these entities within three days. Within seven days, we would expect the diversity and inclusion officer and the human resources folks to make a recommendation to the police chief about how to handle it. Um, this skates a very fine line between the contract we have with the police um, and keeping the public apprised of, of situations like this. The reason it, call, it includes incidents involving use of force, which is a, a recommendation made by a member of the community, is that for instance, the Gacito case, he never filed a formal report. Well, clearly this is something we wanted to know about. We found out about it through Facebook um, and then subsequent meetings. Um, so I would ask that this item be placed on a future agenda for discussion and, um, and adoption. So, uh, uh, Council Member Gregg, Council Member uh, Meadows, you'll be right after Council Member Gregg. So we had, I think, in, uh, when this was brought up in email, somebody might have been Mark. I don't remember. We had a lot of emails today. Um, said, no, like we are only allowed certain amounts of information on open cases, right? So this would really just be part of it because it would be the part that we're available to see or this would be more than we have had access to up until now. Um, I'm not sure. Mr. Yates? Can you help us with this? I'm sorry, with, with what question in particular? Well, I just, I am still, you know, I'm the 
novice in terms of police procedure and court procedure and all of this sort of stuff. So I still don't have a solid um, grasp on what information we are allowed to see when. Um, so like cases that are active and open, we get certain amounts of information. Um, I have been requesting, and I think other council members have been requesting to be given uh, case summaries when we look through our weekly incident report, especially when there's a use of force or some seemingly more serious charge. So the, would this essentially kind of automate what in, individual council members are already asking for, where we would automatically be sent additional information about cases with use of force or where there's a complaint? And also, Mr. Yaden, are we, so are we allowed to do this? So what, what I, I think to ask Jesse's question too, I think the intent is for us to get all of this information, even some of it that we're not getting now, even if, even if we ask for it now, is that, is, is this possible with this resolution? I, I think this resolution says that it says all complaints um, and all incidents shall be forwarded to the city, uh, to the council members and, and the other within three business days. And then they say the referral shall include any video recording. So I don't know that it involves, that it necessarily directs um, anything other than the complaint and the video recording to go. Uh, I don't know that it, uh, um, like it requires police reports and, and so forth. Um, the, the police, when they're investigating uh, complaints of, of their either other people or their own officers, like they do prefer that this type of information not necessarily be made public um, because it can interfere with their investigations. So, um, but, but I think that this would in fact, so, so I think that that's why council has not received all of the information that they might've wanted in the past because of the reticence of the police to, to give out information that might otherwise interfere with their investigations one way or the other. So um, I don't know how the police department feels about this. I, th this is the, First, I'm really looking at this. Okay, uh, Councilmember Greg, were you finished, or do you have another? Well, just you know, I'm generally in favor of us having whatever information we can have, and I would prefer that it be somewhat more automated than it is now. Um, so, you know, I think I I I like the intent behind this, but the specific language of it might have to be adjusted for what we legally have access to. So that, that's all. Uh, Mr. Lahannis and then Mr. Meadows, then Mr. Stevens, and then back to Councilmember Babcock. So I can I can talk to the police department and see just obviously I understand that council would want it more broadly to have more broadly the information. So I understand that that would be your goal. So we could talk about what specifically we could provide. And of course, that's a decision for council. Um, one thing I would like to just make a, make a, make a recommendation on is that it mentions that number two, the human resources director and diversity equity shall make a recommendation to the chief of police. I think they'd probably make a recommendation to me because the chief of police isn't the final decision maker on, on personnel decisions. So they'd make that to me so that I could make a final decision. So that's a, a recommendation as well. But I think we can, you know, I think we understand that video and those types of things need to get out sooner. So I think that that's a pretty uh, standard thing across the country now is that you, we would have, want to have less time of saying we needed to investigate, we need to hold the video back. I think we want to be able to move to getting that out quicker. So that's something I want to discuss with the department on how we can get this information to people much more quickly. So if we can have time to do that, I would certainly want to make just a quick recommendation on that. Mr. Meadows. Gotcha, Aaron. Meadows. I think Councilmember Meadows is in front of me. I apologize. Yeah, I said, I said, Mr. Meadows, you're up. Mark, Mark, Mark. Yeah, you must have been mumbling. The, no. um, I, I, I uh, support this approach. I, I do have some 
some issues with some of the language and I, I have a couple of questions uh, regarding sort of the breadth of what we're releasing. So it's one thing for us to get, in my opinion, anyway, for us to get a copy of the complaint and any of the, the video with regard to it. I think it does put us in a position because we don't have a role then. We don't have a role in this at all. We're just being notified that a complaint has been um, has been made and then we're provided the videos with regard to it, which I guess we're not expected to talk about or make recommendations with regard to, at least according to this. <clears throat> so I, I'm, I'm more satisfied with the idea that we would get uh, we would get notification that a complaint would be filed, but maybe not all the underlying documents with regard to it until there's a resolution of the complaint so that we can then evaluate whether we think something has been done right or wrong and take that up with Mr. Lahanas. The other part of this is that we also release this information to two other groups that don't make a recommendation to Mr. Lahanas. I mean, I think we're asking a lot of people to take a look at things and then not say anything about them. And I, that concerns me a little bit too. Other than that, I think that I would, I think we should be able to know when a complaint involving excessive force. And I think now we are sort of getting that information, but we certainly want to see the complaints so that we can evaluate how serious it looks so that we can be anticipating how we may want to respond with regard to it in the future. But those are my only comments on it. I'm going to send around, like I said, I see a little bit of language change that I'd like to see here. I'll, I'll send a, an email to Council Member Babcock and, and just make suggestions as to what I think can improve this. Thank you, Mr. Meadows. Mr. Stevens. Thank you. Uh, so I have two things on this. Um, one starts with a little bit of a question. So would that video and the case report um, be available to the public in the time frame that it would be available to us if somebody were to request it? Member Babcock, I think that's to you. Possibly, I mean, I it it possibly would. Um, I, no, I'm just I'm asking. Right? You no, I, I don't know. I mean, I would think as well. Right. I I guess I'd I'd like to hear the city attorney's answer because I I don't know for sure. Mr. Yaden. Yes. Um, is the question, would it, would it be available under this resolution as written? No, just, just in general. So let's say this resolution passes. Um, and let's say somebody from the public requests um, what we would have received. You know, say it's three days after the complaint has been made and somebody requests what we received. Um, would they be able to access that like under FOIA? Well, I, I think so and in in it, it depends. Mm -hmm. uh, under, under FOIA, the um, police have a right to uh, withhold materials that are gonna interfere with their investigation. Uh, if, the, if these materials are essentially already made public pursuant to this resolution, yeah. Uh, I don't know that there's a legitimate FOIA exception if, if they're already basically right. in, the, in the public realm. So um, I guess my, you, you kind of look at these FOIA questions on a case by case basis, but if, if it's already out there, um, we don't claim an exception under FOIA because it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, no, I, so that, that was, that was my assumption as well. And the reason why I'm asking is just because, um, you know, I, I would prefer to maybe even have a note in this resolution that basically says like, cause if we're going to be sending it to both the HRC, the study committee, city manager, chief of police, every member of council, I mean, we're, we're public servants, right? So if somebody were to ask us about this, I think it would be you know, inclined to answer and um, that this would just be available publicly or at the least that if somebody were to request it via FOIA, there wouldn't be charges for something that is already kind of public. You know what I mean? 
Um, and I'm, that's not something that I'm directing necessarily directly at the city attorney, more saying that to the rest of council is if, if we're going to make it basically public, you know, should we just make it public <laughs> um, is, is kind of my question. And then the second thing that I had is, is actually in reference to number three on that resolution. Um, it's the uh, allegation of excessive force in the complaint and all video recordings related to the complaint um, shall be forwarded to the county prosecutor to, for determination whether criminal charges against the officer are justified. I wanted to add something at the end of that that also said, or if charges against the individual alleging police use of excessive force, if filed, should be dropped or reconsidered. The reason that I add that is because we obviously had a case where the county prosecutor was going through and was charging a situation and then immediately reverted that that charge and said that we should not be prosecuting this based on the video that they saw. And so I'd like to kind of have a double goal of that if, if you know, we're looking at, you know, charges being brought by the county prosecutor against somebody, um, you know, it's not only um, about charges against the officer, it's also about if there is actually excessive force or the county prosecutor views that arrest is, is not something that should have happened, then, you know, they can make the connection between what might be something on their docket um, to charge the individual as well, so. Okay, hey, so I think what we have, oh, sorry, Councilor Babcock, did you wanna okay. wrap up? Yeah, I'll start with the most recent one first. The prosecutor can always dismiss charges. The prosecutor can also um, fairly easily increase charges against someone who's charged. So that, that's a prosecutorial decision. And as you know, I have a proposal where we would consider um, a council member at the council's ability to ask the city attorney to dismiss charges under certain circumstances. And that's been put on hold mm -hmm. temporarily until post retreat. Um, let's see, going back through um, is the city attorney, Mr. Yaden mentioned the police officer's preference. You know, unfortunately, un unfortunately the preference uh, has been to not disclose any of this. And we learned that the hard way. Um, I, I don't want to be in that situation ever again. Um, I don't know about the FOIA reality. Uh, one of the reasons I included the Human Relations Commission and the Study Committee on Independent Police Oversight Commission, um, which had originally gone to a draft. I know uh, Mr. Meadows was not thrilled with their inclusion, came back from a community member. So I wrote it back in as, as a possibility. First, the Human Relations Commission does a review um, so they get it eventually. Unfortunately, they have they have conveyed that sometimes months have elapsed. They've been in meetings with people who know these things are going on and have pointedly not been told. Uh, the study committee, the thought process there is that to, to give them an idea of the things that their plan will have to address. Um, just, just a thought. Mostly this is just to get away from the fact that something goes in, it gets buried, and it sits on a desk for months until all of us read about it later. Lately, uh, we have been asking for and receiving more detailed information about certain police incidents, but generally speaking, that's been after we pointedly asked for it. Um, that's not always the case, but that's, that's still pretty frequently we have to ask for it. Um, the system as was, wasn't working. There was no transparency. Um, I understand the need to protect an investigation. I understand the need to, you know, you, public employee, you don't want your name <laughs> dragged out there all the time but um, we have to do something that moves it in this direction. This is a proposal. I'd like to see us do something to act on it. 
uh, soon, not tonight, but perhaps on the meeting of July 14 when we come back. And it's intended to be temporary. This is not to usurp what the study committee comes up with or what the subsequent oversight commission does. This is just to fill it in, uh, to allow them to take the amount of time necessary to come up with a process. Um, I want the public to come up with that process and no doubt they will come up with a better process, but this is something for right now. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Meadows. Just wanted to say a couple of things. I think that we can grab language that, that can't hear, can't hear. We can't hear. I, it, it's got to be my computer, but can you hear me now? Yes. Mm. Yes. Okay. The um, I think we can craft language that takes care of those issues and, and what Council Member Babcock wants to get accomplished here. And I would say that I, I, I'm strongly believing that uh, all of the exemptions that are contained in Section 13 of the of the Freedom of Information Act are waivable by a city council, uh, by a body. Uh, they are things that we can um, uh, exempt from FOIA, but they are not things that are required to be exempt from FOIA. So once we do this, it will be a public document and it should be accessible to every member of the public who wants it. I, to, Council Member Stevens or the Mayor Pro Tem's point about the cost. Uh, we also have the ability to answer FOIAs by simply saying it's already on our website and that's how you answer the FOIA. So we, we would make this available, I would assume. Yeah, that, okay, that so was really my, my only point was just that if, if this is basically gonna be public, I you know, imagine that we just make it public, you know. So um, Mr. Meadows and Ms. And Councilor Babcock, um, can you work together and work on this and bring it and send it to Mr. Lahannis to get on the meeting for the 14th? Happy to. And also just, I don't know who's still with us out there, but members of the public, please weigh in. This is, this is a response to, well, this, this is a community project. Please weigh in by email. Thank you. I'm barely with you. So yeah, I think I'm, that is our- yeah, I'm, <laughs> I Council Member Greg. Um, I just wanted to just based on our like uh, little communication misunderstanding this week when we've realized that people who instead of using the council at City of East Lansing address, they use each of our individual addresses and send it to all of us in the same email that that was slipping through the cracks of our communication because it wasn't. Right. Yeah. Anyway, it wasn't following up. So I would encourage people to use both if they wanted to communicate individually with members of council and make it easy for us to respond directly back to you personally. You can always email council at city of East Lansing and every individual council member um, to like make sure that that way it will be less likely to get left out of communication. Although I think that we are also gonna work on a system for any email that is addressed to two different council members getting into communication as well. Um, but anyway, just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, given that, I think we are finished. So we are adjourned. Good work tonight. See you soon. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Thank you.